Welcome to An Architecture, episode 16. So this episode's a bit special in that this is the first time that we're actually sitting in the same room together to record. That's right. I've come out to the U.S. for a friend's wedding, and so we figured while I'm here, we'd try to crank out a couple of podcast episodes. Now, of course, we didn't actually prepare any content to talk about while Joe was going to be here. So we thought we'd try to take on a topic that we could both just kind of riff on a bit and that we didn't have to go back and be looking up a lot of you know statistics and information or references and things uh, we wanted to try to do something a little more off the cuff and just have a conversation yeah so what we thought we could do is speculate a little bit on some future trends that we see developing for cities and the built environment in general and just have some fun sort of doing our own little sci-fi <laughs> finally we get to talk about flying cars <laughs> it's a serious proposition We've come up with a few topics of different kind of technologies and trends that we want to try to weave into an overall narrative or a discussion of trends of urbanization and suburbanization, kind of the big picture of what are the trends shaping the development of the built environment, maybe not in the near future, but looking out more into the distant future. Are the the assumptions that we have now about the way that things are being developed, will those hold up over time? Will there be disruptive technologies that change the way that we develop cities and change people's preferences for where they want to live? And what will all of that mean for government and government management of cities and other aspects of the built environment? Will technology help us to get closer to a point where non-governmental solutions start to make more sense and start to become more acceptable and possibly even inevitable? So Joe, you've come here from Australia, which is 12 hours ahead of us here. So you've been to the future and are now here to report back. So what is the future like? Well, let's see, in Australia, the internet's slow. Uh, We don't really have any Amazon or really reliable online shopping yet. So living in the future, which is Australia, is pretty much like living 15 years ago in the U.S. (laughs) As far as that stuff goes. (laughs) But we've got socialized medical care. (laughs) That works great. Part of the reason for this slow internet is that they've been installing this national broadband network, (laughs) which is, which I haven't got at my house yet. I still have DSL at my house, which I don't know, like like I said, you remember that from 15 years ago in the the US? (laughs) it's, It's like a step up from that, but it still goes over the phone line. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, it's just, it's so unreliable and slow. And I'm like in, you know, I'm in Adelaide, which is a, it's not like I'm out in the sticks somewhere, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but they're putting in this, what they call the National Broadband Network, which is this complete massive boondoggle where they're trying to, originally it was going to, they were going to do fiber to the home for like every home in Australia, including all these remote farms and mines and stuff like that. Uh-huh. Uh, and I think they ended up scaling that back to what they, what they call fiber to the node. So they've got fiber going to like a router on every street or something like that. And then you've got copper coming from there into your home, <laughs> like an Ethernet cable or something. Mm-hmm. And that's a whole national, I mean, government owned yeah. infrastructure system. Yeah, or I mean, like some kind of, you know, monopoly. Uh, it's, it's sort of like a public private thing, but it's, uh, it's completely funded by the government pretty much, I think. I don't know. I, I don't really know all the details of it. Right. I think what's happened with this thing is that. They've been talking about leaving, like I moved to Australia in 2008, and at that point, they had already been talking about this thing for like a decade uh-huh. or something like that, you know? And so when you've got politicians talking about that they want to put in this massive broadband network, well, what does that do to actual investment by other private firms? Yeah, that was what I was going to ask you. Is there already, are there already, you know, broadband? There must be already broadband systems in place by private companies. There's... And are those guys just getting kabooted out or what? Well, I, I, I they're think... just competing with the... the what's going to inevitably be crappy government service over yeah. their stupid system. I mean, I think this is where the public-private sort of thing comes in, you know, because they probably had to get a lot of those guys on board. So I'm not oh, sure. So they're creating kind of a centralized network based on the, some of the existing networks and then tying in and expanding that. Or I think something. it's an all-new network, but then, yeah. but I think the, the existing players have some role in basically selling plans that use this infrastructure. Mm. Right, okay. Yeah. So it's, I'm not sure how it's all set up, but it's a, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> and, and I've heard all kinds of horror. Like people who already have it have had problems where it's just slow as hell. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and it's the sort of thing where by the time it gets installed, 
we're going to have, you know, the next generation wireless, like mobile, you know, 5G exactly. network or something like that, which is going to be faster than it anyway. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what, I mean, that's the thing when you, you hear this a lot and this happens in, in U.S. Some U.S. cities, I think, are, are pursuing this too, where they're trying to put in something like a municipal Wi-Fi. You know, yeah. I think Boston was doing that at one point. I don't know if they've been through with it. But it's, yeah, it's this whole thing where when you have the state selecting and investing in these technologies and installing this whole infrastructure, the minute that those things are installed, they're obsolete, you know, <laughs> yeah. because, I mean, of course, that's just how technology goes in general. But the difference is that when you have private companies doing all of this, then there's an incentive for the private companies to keep all of that infrastructure up to date and, and operating well and becoming better and better, which is why these things become obsolete, because the private companies develop the technologies keep wanting to make them better and better so that they get more customers on board and they can, you know, just get that that competitive edge over whatever the previous company was that, that had all the market share. So they put in the, the next best system and then the old one becomes obsolete and then those guys go back and, and start updating. But when you have these municipal and, and for you, I guess, nationwide governmental systems going in for something like Wi-Fi or, or whatever, the fiber optic network, mm. then once they build this stupid thing, what's the incentive for them to go back and improve it, you know, make continual improvements to keep it up to date. I mean, they've they've built the system. They've essentially kicked out or, or at least crowded out any private investment in in that type of infrastructure, um, at least for a good long while until the thing becomes so unusable that the private systems become <laughs> become competitive again because people want to buy it instead of using just the the, the useless uh, government system. It, it's a perfect example of why government shouldn't be doing infrastructure. I mean, it, it's, these things happen quickly with, with something like, you know, internet technology that turns over every, what, two, three, five, ten, you know, whatever, they're just turning over quickly. Mm. But you take that same idea and you expand it or apply it to something like a road network or a, a water network. And you think about, well, what are we, what are we missing there? You know, are there, are, are there missed opportunities there in terms of efficiency in terms of just even just the quality of maintenance and and opportunities for you know profitability and, and wealth creation and and value creation that are being missed because all of all of our roads for example are provided by government you know we're not looking at roads as a competitive industry of continual improvement roads are a commodity utility where they're just doing in a lot of cases the bare bones that they need to keep people from from driving off the roads and in some cases that doesn't even happen and of course it becomes this whole boondoggle and and this kind of cash grab for all the contractors that get to work on all this stuff to come and do the projects and, and there's a whole system of lobbying and everything else and all these resources that are expended just trying to get certain projects built or not get other projects built and there it's all gets politicized you know you have these bridges to nowhere and all this stuff i think people can when they start to see some of these municipal Wi-Fi systems and things going in, and when they start failing in the way you described, <laughs> I think people cannot wrap their heads around that and say, oh yeah, well, of course, that's, you know, that's not going to work, at least not for very long. But I think it's harder for people to make the leap and realize that the exact same mechanisms are the mechanisms that are used to fund and produce our roads and, and other infrastructure elements that we rely on governments for. Yeah, it's just status quo thinking. You know, they, it's, it's already there, so why would it need to change? You get these grandiose kind of project announcements about, you know, new infrastructure projects when really what needs to happen, where the money needs to be spent is on maintaining what's already there. There's a website and blog that we follow, which is called Strong Towns, which is a pretty libertarian view on urban development with a particular focus on making small towns more financially viable. And he really emphasizes this point a lot that cities need to be focused on maintenance at least as much as they are on new development. However, you get all these federal funds programs that will only go to building new roads, you know, building a new four-lane highway from here to there, which isn't really what's needed. So I would definitely recommend any of our listeners to check out the Strong Towns. They've got a, a blog and a podcast, and they do a lot of real-world implementation of the sort of ideas that he's promoting, where he'll go and actually work with a local city council to try to get them to balance the checkbook and focus on the projects that really matter. So thinking about the future and the future of cities, one trend that's kind of along the lines of, of what we've just been talking about is this idea of smart cities. So the idea here is that you're going to take a city, you know, let's, take, let's say you take a city like Boston, and you're going to build into that city this infrastructure of, I guess, data, or kind of data management, where you have things like cameras and, and traffic sensors, and buildings might have their, their heating systems that are tied into some kind of a network or their power meters that are all tied into this network 
that then has some level of management from the city, or at least from some kind of central management agency. Maybe if it's a power grid, then the power company has some control over that. And the idea is that, well, if we take all of this stuff and centrally manage it, then of course we can make it more efficient so that, you know, one building is less efficient in its heating system than some other building, then somebody from up on high can, you know, turn the dial and, and <laughs> turn down their heating or, or something. I'm, I think I've exaggerated a bit here, but that, that's, that's the general idea is that you can have some level of control at these, these upper levels, typically within, within government, I guess, or, or maybe within some kind of monopoly utility company that is kind of micromanaging or at least macromanaging the energy usage. And when you look at things like traffic, somehow better managing traffic by timing lights differently at certain times of the day, which of course, you know, makes sense. But the idea is that, that all of this stuff is being managed from up on high with, you imagine somebody in like a, a NASA control center, right? Yeah, <laughs> Mission screens control. Over the 20 screens in front right, of them. 20 screens over them. And they see like a car pull up to the stoplight and they hit the button and the light goes green. <laughs> and or, I don't know, again, an exaggeration, but, and really, I guess that's not even it. I guess the whole thing would be that at some point, all of this stuff becomes automated, right? Yeah. You have algorithms that are then used to. Or AIs. Um, Right, or AI that are used to take in all this data and to manage it. So, I think another driver for it too is just collecting all this data so that you can use that to drive your future you know, development decision making too. Mm -hmm. So that you can determine you know, what kind of projects you want to work on and, and, and where do you need to be spending money to sort of make the city run more efficiently. A lot of traffic networks already have something like this. You know, they've got some sort of centralized traffic management center where they've got cameras all over the place and mm -hmm. sensors. Um, I know in Adelaide, there's some different sort of, I guess, experiments that they've done with timing lights yeah. in certain places so that, you know, set up so that if you're driving the right speed, you just hit a green light everywhere. Yeah, they have like, that in Pittsburgh, too. They have kind of a one-way a one-way loop Yeah. Um, in an area of Pittsburgh where, where if you, <laughs> you get a green light, if you go just the right speed, you can hit every green light the way. I think Manhattan does it, too, don't they? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of cities do it, but yeah. it's a really complex problem because, you know, you can do that with one street right. and kind of favor that one street. Right. But then <laughs> what does that do to all the other streets? You know, so you get this sort of complex problem that and that's actually the sort of thing that an AI could be good with with helping to to solve uh -huh. you know you get these this sort of optimization algorithm and especially even doing it in real time you know where if they're really tracking you know how many cars are on the road some ai might be able to work out at least probabilistically if you got so many cars at this side of town so many cars on this side of town on this road to sort of predict well what's going to happen once all those cars you know half hour from now when they're all meeting at this one intersection or something like that and you know to time things a bit better that way you can see where there's going to be some benefits to this sort of technology, but with any of this sort of stuff, I mean, there's so much complexity to it that I, I think there's got to be some sort of upper limit to what can actually be achieved mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, additional efficiency or, you know, getting cars to move a little faster or whatever. Yeah, again, I mean, I think there's from a kind of an engineering and technology standpoint, I'm sure there's viability there. And for, like you said, for certain types of systems, like something like a grid, you know, like yeah. Manhattan, you have a grid, I, that, that's probably easier to manage and to make some kind of a system like that work right. than downtown Boston, yeah. <laughs> which is just, you know, a rat's nest of roads and cow paths and things yeah. and all one way. And, you know, you can't, Google can't even get you through, through Boston. If you go on Google maps, <laughs> like in Boston, like you're done. <laughs> it just doesn't, you will not get there. <laughs> With smart grids, I think there's some opportunities there for things like cycling when, let's say everyone's running air conditioning. Well, if you've got a smart grid and you've got air conditioners, you know, smart air conditioners that are all linked up to this thing. Sorry, you're talking about power grid now. Power grid, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Then um, what you can do is you could, if you're the central guy, well, you can sequence things so that you don't have everyone's air conditioner starting up at the same time and peaking the system. Mm -hmm. So you can really smooth out the load a bit more, which is really beneficial for maintaining your power quality. And, you know, you don't have to start up additional generators every time, you know, half the city's air conditioners turn on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, so I think it's fair to say that, that there can be applications where some level of information gathering and kind of top-down management for some of these systems can work and can be beneficial. But of course, you know, I would wonder with any of these kind of things, are, are you starting to get into a Hayekian knowledge problem, you know, mm -hmm. where, where there's just, like you said, it's, it's a system of complexity where there's so much information out there and that the information isn't necessarily explicit, you know, that there's, that there's tacit information that's not able to be detected by the system that it ends up favoring certain outcomes and creating kind of unintended consequences. Of course, you know, that we talk about this in Austrian economics. If you take those same ideas and apply them to 
management of something like a traffic system or something like a power grid, are you going to start to have some of those problems as well? Now, of course, you know, AI, we all have this great hope for AI that it can start to manage some of these problems and some of these complex problems that we mere mortals uh, (laughs) can't figure out, you know, as long as it doesn't become self-aware and try to kill all of us. (laughs) But that's not really Hayek's point. Hayek's point isn't so much that people can't sort out all the information that's available. His point is that the information isn't necessarily available until people act. So, you know, if you're driving your car, like you said, if, if there are certain cars going a certain way to an intersection, well, how do you know that, that where those cars are going? How do you know right. if they're going to go to this intersection and not go to that well, that's intersection? because or... you've already programmed your route into your autonomous car. <laughs> right. Okay. I mean, so <laughs> Which there's... is tiled into the city network. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it gets into this whole, uh, of course, then there's a... They, they get into privacy issues. Well, yeah, not there's... just privacy, but, but then is it like, really? Like, is that, are we all like, going to like call it mother government and tell her where we're going and then that's going to uh, get us there. No, no, you won't. You, you'll just do it in your car and your car will do it. It'll be built in at the factory. Right, and they'll just have a reader that'll say, this is where this guy's going. Yeah, and there'll, there'll be some central you know, website that's sort of tracking all these these route plans. It'll be like air traffic control, you know, but on a, on a much larger scale. <laughs> right, but like you look at like even, right, and I know all this technology is going to get better, but so for example, you take something like Waze, right? Like this way yeah. is this great app that that'll find, you know, re- route you around traffic and everything, which is great. But the thing with Waze is if you put in, if you're going along a long route, like let's say you're going from, you know, Boston to, to Florida or something. Yeah. And you put it into Waze, it's not going to route you around every little traffic lip along the way because it can't do all the calculations between here and there yeah. and to get you there. And it doesn't know by the time you get there what the traffic condition is going to be. Right. So it'll just put you on the highway. Yeah. You know, if you do a short little thing, then yeah, I can give you this crazy route through some neighborhood to get yeah. around, you know, a backup on the highway. <laughs> but, you know, I think that's, that's when you think about this being applied en masse to everybody that's on the road, at least some significant portion of people on the road, how useful is that information really? You know, mm-hmm. like what are they really doing with it? Like just to time a traffic light? <laughs> like, is that really going to affect the fact that you have thousands of people coming into Boston at, at eight o'clock in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> like, what difference does a traffic light time you make? Yeah. With something like that. I mean, yeah, I'm sure it could make some difference. But, <laughs> and you think of what it's going to take to build that network and the cost and the, again, these kind of boondoggles yeah. to build this thing. And is that really, what's the benefit of that? You know, is it really going to smooth out traffic in Boston? Is it going to create more parking spots? You know, (laughs) I don't, I I somehow doubt that. Yeah. It's the sort of thing that if they can do it incrementally and realize sort of incremental benefits from it, then I could see that being viable, at least to a certain extent, because you'll get to a point where you say, well, okay, look, we've built it out this much. We can see the benefits that we've got from it. So do we want to go to the next step and, and do the next thing, make the next investment? And again, I think if it was private industry developing that stuff, then they'd approach that problem rationally and really take into consideration all those costs and benefits. But when it's the state doing it, it's more about does it look like we're doing the right thing? And, right. you know, you get some politician that they want to be able to talk about all the latest and greatest technology that they're going to install into the city. Right. Because it makes them look good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, for politicians to stand up and say, we're going to have a smart city, yeah. you know? I mean, <laughs> who's not going to be on board with that? Yeah. You know, but it's like you realize that like they're putting in all this infrastructure and stuff to figure out that they need to, you know, change the traffic light going in this direction in the morning and right. this direction in the afternoon. It's like, yeah. really? You couldn't just like send a guy out there with a clicker <laughs> and like count the cars on one day and then be like, you know what? There are more cars going south into Boston from New Hampshire <laughs> in the morning and more cars leaving in the afternoon. <laughs> huh. Oh, wow. Maybe we should uh, time some of those lights different. I came up a while ago with an idea for um, some sort of like market-based traffic light timing system where you can have maybe some sort of Bitcoin type token or something. You buy a bunch of tokens and then you're sitting at a stoplight and you can basically bid on when you want the light to change. So if you get people going different ways. Yeah, that's what we need is more people on their phones at a stoplight. <laughs> That'll make traffic go faster. I mean, you can have it automated, right? So you, so you set some sort of budget for your trip. And then, uh, I don't know. Yeah. But, well, the other, the other downside to that is in that what that would do is, I mean, you could essentially use it to fund roads because people are paying money just to, you know, voluntarily paying yeah. money to bid up the traffic lights. And you figure it's the sort of thing where like, okay, if you got an ambulance, you know, an ambulance could have say a big budget for this you know they'd be just buying green lights all the way or of course you know obviously for ambulances you'd probably just let them through anyway yeah you know. i was just but, gonna but say, let's say nobody's nobody's gonna be on board with the system that we're in <laughs> we're just just there behind some cab driver you know bidding up the price <laughs> yeah no but but let's say you know someone's running late for a meeting or something like that right yeah so they could have the opportunity to say well look 
I'm just going to pay 10 bucks to get me through this traffic light here. Yeah. You know, other, other people, like three cents or something. Right. You know? right. So like that guy, he doesn't want to miss his flight or whatever. It's worth it to him yeah. to pay, you know, 10, 20 bucks or whatever for every, every traffic light. So he doesn't have to buy a new ticket when he gets to the airport. Okay. Right. So, so the better way that that could happen is like you said, he, he puts his route in and he puts, clicks a priority button, you know, right. puts the expedited, whatever. Right. And then somehow, somehow the <laughs> and, actual uh, bidding and, is automated. And then the system tracks him through it. Yeah. And it's automated. And as he, as he gets to the lights, you know, they, they change green yeah. for him or something, or, you know, he, he hopes that, but he, he well, that's because there could be someone going, the, going against him who's, you know, bid up on another light. <laughs> right. It's not going to be perfect, of course, but, but yeah, but that's the sort but, of thing that markets, you know, precisely good at solving is, right. and that's just exactly the sort of thing where you've got all this sort of tacit information about you know, who's going where, who's got priority to go where, who, you know, who really is in a rush versus yeah. who doesn't really care. I mean, you could even have something where people sitting at a red light are being compensated for their time, right. you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> depending on, on what the bidding is and, and, you know, maybe whoever owns the road or whatever gets a cut of that. And, and you know, I thought that was an interesting way that you could maybe fund the roads I and mean, who knows how much money you could raise that way. But uh, the one downside I see to it is that what it does is it incentivizes putting traffic lights everywhere, right? Right. <laughs> because, yeah, because if that's the way you're making the money, then, you know. Yeah, but no, it could be because it could be based on a certain time for a certain route, right? Yeah. So, like, you're, you're going to pay this much to get from point A to point B. And if you don't make it in that time, then you pay less. Or if you get there sooner, you pay more. You know, like, yeah. there could be this thing where it's not you're paying for every every light that you go through. Right. Because right? <laughs> you're right. That, yeah, I guess it would create that. But if you're, if you're paying for an expedited route, then it, it's up to, you know, the, the road designers to come up with the best way to to facilitate that and to economize that. And, and of course, that gets us to, to the real answer here to to smart cities is that the best way to make cities smarter is to privatize, you know, these networks, privatize the road network so mm -hmm. that you have private owners who are, are looking for those ways to make the traffic flow more efficient, make the road safer, like, you know, red light cameras and speed cameras and things like that are, that are all, you know, can all be tied into this kind of a, of a smart city system that each owner of a system, you know, each each owner of, of a, let's say they have a, a certain road network in a certain part of town, mm. you know, they're going to have certain priorities that they're going to try to solve with, with their own technology. And there might be benefits to them tying into a broader network with other road networks, with some kind of policing network or, or policing system, yeah. right? I mean, some kind of security system for the roads and, and for other public spaces in general when the, the roads are owned privately and all these this infrastructure like you said the, the power grids and things are owned privately if those guys come up with some idea to make it more efficient and that if that involves some kind of a big data you know smart city technology and mm -hmm. they and they give people a cheaper rate to use their road they're putting in their route and using that whole network then yeah that could probably work great but i think that when you try to do this stuff at the municipal level with governmental owners of the roads and governmental owners of these smart city systems i just don't see the incentive structure being there for them to first of all get it right the first time and second of all maximize the use and and be continually updating the technology in a way that optimizes it and that makes it deliver on its on its promises yeah and it's a sort of thing too where you know you can only optimize what you can measure Right. These sort of things. You right. Know? Well, that, that's yeah, the high issue. Right? I mean, I guess the idea is that you know you try to find more and more things that you can measure, but um, the question is whether those things you're measuring are actually what's relevant to solving the problems. Right. Yeah. That, that the people are facing. Right. The the, the um, it's what you do. It's not how you do it. Right. <laughs> like right. If you're <laughs> if you're economizing on the wrong things, yeah. <laughs> then you know what, what good is that doing? Yeah. And if the benefits of these smart cities are coming from the fact that everyone's driving automated cars and everything's tied in together, then I guess, you know, how much of a leap is it to go from here to there before you actually start realizing those benefits? So in other words, in order to realize the benefits from a smart city, if you need to have, you know, a certain number of the population driving automated cars, oh, I see what you're saying. a certain number of population, maybe just with cars that have new sensors in them or something like that, you know, plus all this infrastructure and the road networks, plus all this communications infrastructure, plus all the, the big data crunching, plus whatever other systems you're tying into it. You know, it's sort of like this massive leap you have to make as opposed to something that you could do more incrementally. And, and, and I don't know, maybe, you know, there probably are ways to roll it out more incrementally. You know, you well, yeah, focus so let's, on certain neighborhoods or something like that to start with. and then So let's keep talking about the, the idea of traffic, right? So the way to make some of these improvements with traffic 
as you said, you, you mentioned automated vehicles, mm. right? And that that seems like I mean that this is this is coming, right? Yeah. This is coming in our our lifetimes, you know, probably in the next 10 years, I think most of us will have an opportunity to buy an automated car. And maybe in 20 years, maybe you will only be able to buy an automated car, you know, maybe people, other than for, you know, kind of sport racing, you know, sporting right. kind of things. Or antique hot rods and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure, you know, it's... it's um, Except you have to convert them to electric. <laughs> right. <laughs> they'll, make, they'll make gasoline cars will be illegal by then. <laughs> Well, but yeah, so think about this, you know, it's not going to happen right away, but as you get more and more automated vehicles on the road, you have the possibility of maybe these vehicles don't all have to talk to a central network. Maybe they just have to talk to each other, right? right. So maybe it's, I mean, probably not Bluetooth because Bluetooth is garbage, but maybe there's some <laughs> kind of kind of localized network where all of these automated vehicles have some means of communicating with each other. So if, if your automated vehicle is driving down the road and the automated vehicle in front of you slams on its brakes, your vehicle doesn't wait to see the brake lights go on in that vehicle. At the minute that that vehicle says hit the brakes, your vehicle hits the brakes too because right. they have that line of communication. And the you know part of the other thing that can do is there's this YouTube video I saw about how basically how traffic develops, kind of this butterfly effect thing. Yeah. And what they did is they had 20 cars in a big parking lot just driving around in a circle, right? They had this big circle yeah. and they were all kind of not quite bumper to bumper, but, you know, pretty evenly spaced where if they all went the same speed, they could just kind of keep going and going and going. And of course, what happened very quickly was you had some people kind of going a little faster, a little slower, kind of stopping and starting. Yeah. And in no time at all, the, this whole circle was just a complete traffic jam, right? <laughs> because that's what we humans do. We, yeah. we're, we're, we're acting on our, our perceptions and, and in a car, it's, it's all these, these slight adjustments of speed and, and, you know, you hit the brakes and the guy behind you slows down just because he sees the brake lights go on and, and that, that's how we humans drive. So you would think that with automated vehicles, especially if they're able to communicate with each other and kind of in the way I just described, that somehow all of that could be smoothed out a bit, right? Mm. And not only that, but that they could be talking, and this, again, might have to happen over a central network, but maybe it's just over the internet, that they are talking to each other, not just the car behind you, but the car 10 miles behind you, 20 miles behind, behind you, who's coming to the same spot, mm. and all of a sudden is starting to see this the traffic get a little more dense in that area. Now all those other cars can, you know, using something like Waze, right? They, they can, they'll just start to reroute automatically mm. and start to diffuse the traffic onto alternate routes. So there's, it takes all that kind of stupid human decision-making that causes traffic in the first place. Yeah. I mean, look, sometimes you have so many cars on the road that it just takes time for them all to get where they're going. But you can imagine that traffic could flow much more smoothly with integrated automated vehicles. But that doesn't require some kind of centralized management system, right? right? You can have each of these cars as kind of individual actors that all they need is the information from the other cars or from the, the broader kind of network of vehicles. And then they can each start to make their own decisions and then in turn inform all the other vehicles of what they're doing. And so it, it's a matter of each vehicle kind of making it, making its own mind about where it's going to go rather than some centralized Borg, you know, that's sending out uh, commands to all of these individual vehicles. That could probably happen much more effectively if it was a decentralized process where these vehicles had access to all the information that they were able to provide to each other. Yeah, and I've seen there's other um, visualizations of what might be happening with automated vehicles too, where they show an intersection and you've basically just got like a cluster of cars yeah. all together that blast through this thing at, you know, 50 miles an hour or whatever. Yeah. And then another cluster of cars coming the other way, blast through it. You know, <laughs> right. so, so basically... So they're not stopping. And yeah, so, so there's no stop start. So that it's all timed and, and the cars are all grouped together. Right. But they're all going at continuous speed, but they've got these gaps in between them uh -huh. so that they can, you know, manage the cars coming the other way. <laughs> okay, so they all just space each other's, right? And yeah. They space themselves with relation to each other. Yeah. And then go through. Yeah, or even if it's like kind of one-on-one, -on -one, just kind of like basket weaving, right? Like one goes and then the yeah. next one goes next yeah. one goes uh, yeah i mean you think that if you could i mean you know assuming that what we're saying is actually possible the hell mm. do we know but, <laughs> but you can imagine that if you could have these even incremental improvements in traffic flow that it starts to cut down your journey times right um yeah. or at least at least during some of the like, peak period kind of travel times that if they can start to smooth some of those things out that it it makes longer journeys more more palatable, and it makes hopefully you know reduces traffic deaths. I mean, mm. I mean that that's I think really the great promise of automated vehicles is that they could. I mean, you know, there's always you know deer runs into the road, car can't stop in time. Right. 
it's going to hit the deer. But you would imagine that there could be vast improvements in vehicle safety just based on accident avoidance if all these cars are able to better predict what's happening in front of them. Now, one thing about having faster commute times is that there's a phenomenon called induced demand, which is where, let's say, you widen a road. So that speeds up the commute times for people for a little while. But then what happens is more people start realizing that that road is faster. So they start taking that road. Mm -hmm. So you end up with more traffic on that road. And usually it ends up that there is no actual gain in the, in the time that it takes. In to, the, the travel time. In the travel time. Yeah. But that's kind of a long-term effect. So this is about, you know, people, let's say you have a 20-minute commute and then you widen the road and it becomes a 15-minute commute. Uh-huh. Well, then what happens is you might get more development, more suburban development. So you got more people living there now because now they've got a 15-minute commute to the, to the city. Right. So this is a sort of long-term effect where commute times end up equalizing regardless of how many roads you build or how, how wide you make a road. And I think the same sort of effect could happen with some of these automated cars. And it could be that with automated cars, because people aren't driving, they can actually use that time productively. So you could be sitting in your automated car, but it'd be like having a limo ride. Right. You could be sitting and have an office set up in the back seat of your automated car. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you're sitting there doing your, checking your emails and stuff on your way into work. Yeah. And so in that case, I could imagine that a lot of people would accept even a longer commute because they can actually use that time more productively. And, and they don't care if they're sitting at a stoplight or if they're stuck in traffic or whatever. Because, yes. You know, they can actually use that time. So I think that what that could lead to is even more sort of suburban and exurban development for residential and then even people are still commuting into the city. Yeah, I think we were, as I was thinking about this episode, I had the same thought. And I started thinking about kind of some numbers, right? Like, let's say right now, let's just take like an hour. Let's say that that's the maximum tolerable commute, you know, for an average person. Yeah. So if you kind of draw an hour commute as the ring around the city where we're going to have people who want to live in, in some kind of a suburb and commute into the city, you know, let's just put that out there. The constraint there isn't distance. It's time to get into the city. Yeah. Let's say that whatever through the, the great promise of, of automated travel, mm. <laughs> let's say that that commute time is cut in half, right? Let's say you had a 50-mile radius around the city, right? And that's where you could get into within an hour um, to the city. I know it's a lot less than that in a rush hour in, in a lot of places, but let's keep the math simple here. So now if you're having the commute time for that 50 miles, um, now your hour commute is a 100-mile radius yeah. out from the city. So if you do the math on that here, having the commute time doesn't just double the area of suburban development that's within that hour radius of the city. It actually quadruples it. So, you know, a 50 mile radius around a city is 7,850 square miles. Whereas when you double the radius of that commute, that expands out to 31,000 <laughs> square miles around the city that becomes viable suburban development area with access to the city of under an hour commute. So, as you said, and, and you know, it, it's unlikely that even the best technologies that we can imagine today would reduce travel time by half but you know it just it shows you that there's a, an exponential relationship between reducing travel time and expanding the potential area of suburban development on top of that as you said you know if, if people can then use that time productively in their vehicle and those commutes become more tolerable mm. that makes longer commutes more tolerable and it also makes more people willing to commute and willing to take those longer commutes um, into the cities and so it, just something like like having automated vehicles could really multiply the number of people who are willing to come into the city to work and can really expand the area from which they're willing to come now, of course, with that scenario, too, you'd, you'd have that effect of induced demand where you start building it out and you'll get that much more of traffic jam, you know, closer to the city. Right. Yeah. But that's kind of an iterative process, right? Where right. it's like, you I mean, so there, there'll be a point like what, what I'm saying is that it's not going to expand out that hundred miles out. It's, it might go to like 75 before right, right. the traffic kind of gets unbearable. Right. I mean, like, I mean, you before know, you hit that limit, when you're driving into the city, it's, you don't hit the, the traffic 50 miles out of the city. You hit it within the last, you know, right. five miles. I mean, of course it's more than that in some cities, but you know, the last five miles, like that doesn't change. Right. Right? I mean, it does it hopefully can to some extent with some of the automated vehicles and then potentially some kind of smarter management of road networks Yeah, and more responsive road networks that are, you know, again, if they're privately owned, that are hopefully more responsive to actual demand on the roads because they're incentivized to respond to demand. But yeah, of course, it's, you know, 
the example I gave was kind of a, a maximum, <laughs> but it just goes to show you that if you are able to cut those commute times down, that it can really expand the potential for suburbanization. Now, of course, the question has to be asked, why are so many people going into the city in the first place, mm. <laughs> especially from the suburbs? I mean, we can, we can talk and we'll probably come back in a little bit and talk about why people uh, want to be living in the cities. So yeah, it makes sense for people who are living in the city to be working in the city. But why do people want to be living you know, an hour away in the suburbs and then driving into the city? What's so special about the city where they have to be there rather than working from home or working remotely? This is certainly a trend we're seeing now. It's, it's something that, as we said in, in episode six, when my wife and I were traveling, she was able to work remotely in some capacity from all over the world. And we were in places like, you know, Panama, where we had <laughs> internet on a cell phone SIM card, yeah. you know, on just a, like a not uh, certainly substandard network, probably worse than yours in Australia. <laughs> um, and she, you know, she was able to get done what she needed to do it was a bit of a hassle in some of those places. Yeah. But, you know, we sorted it out. And so, you know, we're at this point where at least for knowledge based, you know, knowledge workers, um, people who are working on computers, and collaborated on computers, it becomes, I think, less important for them to be sitting at a desk in an office with a supervisor, you know, looking over their shoulder. And so the potential for remote work technology, you know, there's a question there of when people can work remotely, why are they going into the city in the first place? Or, you know, for example, my wife works with a firm down in, in Boston and she primarily works from home, but she generally goes down one day a week into Boston and, you know, works in the office there. And that's when they often schedule meetings with clients that she and the other woman she works with can, can go and meet with them together, which works fine. But as I've mentioned in previous episodes, we recently bought a new house um, in Maine and we're just about an hour from Boston. In fact, my wife can hop on a bus here and take it right into South Station in Boston to get to her office. That's coming to be more and more of a of a viable model, I think, for for employees, especially when everybody got email and everything, where there was this expectation that people were just available all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think we've gotten to a point where people are starting to push back against that a little bit and trying to reclaim some kind of a work life balance. You know, especially, and of course, I'm saying this from personal experience where I've now, <laughs> I left my job and, and um, have now started up my own practice where I can work from home and kind of make my own hours and try to maintain at least some kind of flexibility in my hours, if not the overall amount of hours that mm. I'm working, uh, which so far has tended to be, I think, more than, than I was working at the firm. I think that that will certainly be an increasing trend where people are, are demanding more flexibility to work remotely and where employers are more willing to accommodate that because it gives them, you know, if they can allow somebody to work remotely, it gives them a broader pool of people that they can tap for employment, you know, that are going to kind of want to come and work for them. Um, it's almost becomes a benefit that they offer to try to attract people, attract talented people who don't want to sit in traffic for an hour, you know, at the beginning and end of their day. Yeah. And a lot of the jobs that are around these days tend to be more knowledge based anyways writing code or doing graphic design or in the u.s yeah. or at least at least in you know most of the sort of developed nations manufacturing the stuff that does require you to be in a specific place a lot of that's just becoming more more and more automated these days and especially you know if we're talking about the future you're going to be having robots building robots to build other things <laughs> you know <laughs> right 3d printing and all that and you know self-assembling equipment and and at some point i think people will realize that the fewer meetings you have, the more productive everyone actually is. <laughs> so you don't really need to be all in the same place. Maybe one day a week you go into an office to meet up or something like that. But even now, we do a lot of meetings with customers over video conference or mm -hmm. yeah, it's become a standard. Skype or whatever. Everybody kind of realizes the efficiency there and appreciates the ability to, to just be able to log into a meeting without having this whole production of, of you know, getting somewhere and yeah. <laughs> you know, all, that, all that kind of overhead time that is spent just getting preparing for meetings and traveling and there is something to be said for face-to-face -face meeting especially in sales meetings and stuff with customers you know you can get a much different response from a customer if you're sitting down with them face to face than you can even over a video chat or something like that so mm -hmm. i would see for at least sales visits you'd probably still see a lot of face-to-face -face, a lot of traveling and that sort of thing i don't really see that 
reducing too much. So I will say this. So this everything we've just talked about um, has been my view for a while that this is the way things are going, mm. that everybody's going to be working remotely, that you know nobody who wants to go to an office. I mentioned in our episodes with Patrick Schumacher that I was able to participate in this kind of follow salon discussion <laughs> with Patrick and some other um, architecture professionals yeah. um, after that interview I did with him. We actually had two of these meetings that I was invited to. And one of them, we, we kind of got onto this topic about development and where it's going to happen. There's this issue in England, of course, we talked about in our episode 10 and, and the other episodes about Patrick Schumacher, about the housing crisis in England. And one solution they're proposing there is to build new cities. I mean, entirely, I think they call them new towns or, or something. I forget. But they've done this before in England. There's a town called Milton Keynes, which I don't think has anything to do with either Milton Friedman or John Maynard Keynes. Keynes. <laughs> But it's this city that was built in, I think it was the 70s, as what they called a new town. And the idea was that they were going to build a city essentially from nothing to provide for the housing needs of the country. And so, of course, now this idea has come up again that they have some plans for certain new towns in certain areas around England where they want to just try to address their housing problems and housing costs by just creating all these new cities, these new houses. And so part of the discussion that we had that I had with Patrick and this other group was, well, okay, so what should our role as architects be in guiding this type of development and in creating the kind of architectural models that might develop? Uh, Milton Keynes is a, a really interesting example where, again, in the 70s it was built, and it was kind of at the tail end of the kind of modernism, urban renewal era. But the guys who did it were kind of like, I don't know if you call them hippies, but they were kind of, they're a little bit out there. <laughs> and they, they end up with this, this design that's very car-centric, which it, it gets criticized for being very car-centric. But then they also have a lot of parks and a lot of green space around it. And their idea was that, I think part of it was that they were kind of focusing the cars in this, this one area that's really the kind of the commercial center. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, you know, some of the, the typical things we get into with, with use zoning and things like that. Mm. Um, I, I drove through Milton Keynes one time. And yeah, it's, it's, this whole center is really just like, I mean, it's all built kind of around the automobile, but still has some density and stuff that we don't tend to have in an American kind of you know, strip mall development. Right. <laughs> it's an interesting case study. So we're having this discussion of, you know, what, what should the model be for some of these new cities? And we got into talking about why are we building all these cities so far out from the city? You know, of course, Patrick was arguing that we should be really focusing on densifying within the city, right? That was his whole, right. a real core focus of his, his housing speech that he had given that brought him all this controversy, was that cities should be freeing up the possibility of building more density into city centers, because that's all this development is trying to get people into city centers, right? All the suburban development yeah. is just about creating these transit hubs where people can then get into the city. And so we got talking about this idea of, well, you know, we have people working remotely now and you're, you're, it's less important that you be in the city. And Patrick was like, no, no, you got to be in the city. It's like, <laughs> if you're not in the city, like you don't exist <laughs> yeah. I mean, in so many words, you know. Yeah, right. But he had a really strong view that cities matter, that you need to be in the city if you're going to be one of the, you know, a top performing firm. If you're going to be at the forefront of knowledge and at the forefront of, you know, kind of networking and, and socialization within an industry and within a discipline like architecture, yeah. he says, you got to be in the city. Uh, one guy even said, well, let's say you live, like I live in no, this town, which is like, you know, in 15 minutes, I can be on a train and, and get into the city cent you know, central part of London. Yeah. He's like, that's too far. <laughs> he's, like, no. he's like, if you can't, I mean, almost to the point, like if you can't walk there, like you're, you're in the hinterland. <laughs> you know? So, so of course, I've been thinking of a, about it a lot more since then, um, based on his perspective. And I get his perspective. It's, it's really this idea of what, you know, he's used the term economies of agglomeration that, yeah. And this is why people are going to cities in the first place and why so much of the world is now urbanizing so rapidly because, uh, you know, at least in developed countries, we've had these efficiencies in agriculture and you don't need to have as many people in rural areas. And yet there is this demand for more knowledge workers. Um, you know, it was the Industrial Revolution started this whole urbanization movement where you had people moving in to work at these centralized manufacturing facilities. Um, and now that's really transitioned to where the cities are really the core locations for, for knowledge-based companies. And the analogy that Patrick makes is that, you know, cities are the brains that direct the rural muscle. I think is the term he used. <laughs> by that he means, he doesn't, you know, it doesn't mean... Well, that's, what, that's the demand center. So that's, you know, if, if they're producing farm goods or whatever manufacturing that's more rural. 
Is well, yeah, it's the it's, decisions they make in the, in the country are going to be driven by the you know the economic demands of the city. Right? Yeah, and and even like the production processes and the raw materials production distribution, all that stuff, yeah. even that's happening outside of the city. That are the decisions that are made to direct all of those processes happen in the cities. They right. happen in the, the knowledge centers at the, the, the head more centralized firms. And maybe not just the head office, but but they're happening in in the management centers, which tend to be in cities. And so he sees that as something that's not going to change. It's that's really going to, I think, going to intensify as you have more and more knowledge based work that's going to continue to be centralized within cities. Of course, he he runs his own firm, which is which is based in the city. They do have offices all around the world. But he, you know, he says, I want to be able to communicate directly with all my workers. And someone's doing this, I can go right over to him and talk with him about this. And yeah. that's what I've read about him. This is kind of how he manages the office. He spends a whole day just kind of going desk to desk and talking to people <laughs> about all these these various projects that yeah. they have going on as a Hadid Architects. Yeah. And so it's uh, you think about that, and you think about it from his perspective as the employer and as the person who's managing that firm. He's like. You know, he says, yeah, I want people who, who want to be here, who want to be in the office, who want to be engaged with what's going on, who want to be at the center of the city where they have access to, to lectures and to, to university courses and to, you know, museums and, and, Arts. and exhibits and things that influence and inform for them the discipline of architecture. So, you know, have, hearing that and, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, I mean, that yeah, I get that. I see how that isn't going to go away, let's just say. Right. You know, I think the remote work trend will continue and will become viable for a lot of people. But I've more come around to Patrick's view that the city as the center of commerce is not going to go away. And in fact, it's, it's intensifying, especially in developed countries. Yeah, and Ed Glazer, who's a Harvard professor, and he's kind of a big name in the whole urban development world. That's kind of his thesis, too. Is he's got a book called The Triumph of the City. He makes some of those same points that the value in the city is all about the value of the network, you know, the real world social network of the, the city. And like you said, that agglomeration of amenities and residences, commercial buildings, restaurants, all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. is, is what really drives the attraction for people to live in cities. He basically thinks that we need to be building you know, new skyscrapers, uh -huh. just, just build up, build yeah. up everything. <laughs> right, which is, um, I mean, Patrick, so I would think we'd be on board with that too, yeah. Yeah, his, his thing is basically skyscrapers and, and universities is, is <laughs> the two things he says that we need to be building in cities. Now, I think I think the universities thing is a little bit more speculative and there's probably less less real-world evidence supporting that. I mean, I guess the idea is the universities themselves can kind of benefit from this network effect, but also you have people coming out of these universities who are moving into jobs in the city with whatever kind of new technology that's been developed and, and you know, new ideas. Yeah, I think that's something that's happened. And so I went to school in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon University. And Pittsburgh, over the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years or so, you know, of course, it used to be the Steel City and um, went through some tough times and has now kind of reemerged as a kind of a tech center, right? <laughs> like yeah. they've developed all this tech industry. And I think a big part of that is, is having, in particular, Carnegie Mellon University there, where they have strong programs in things like robotics and computer science. And I think you have people who have, have gone to school there and are still probably in some sense interacting with the university and you know, graduate programs and, and students there who realized that Pittsburgh could be a good place to start up their own business. And so you have all these kind of tech startups mm. in Pittsburgh of all places. Yeah. And now it's become this kind of example of what every city says they want to do, which right, is yeah. to develop we're tech, gonna, right? We're going to be the new Pittsburgh, yeah. yeah. I mean, Adelaide even says this, you know. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Pittsburgh? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen articles <laughs> in like, the local paper about like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to be the new Pittsburgh, you know, tech center. Yeah. They've just built this whole, um, well, so they've built this new hospital. Which you know, speaking of speaking of boondoggles, <laughs> we could probably do an episode on that one at some point. But they've also in the same area they they've basically built up this whole kind of medical precinct. So there's the big hospital next to it. There's this you know research medical research building, which is a state funded thing. But then the University of I think it's the University of South Australia has built another couple of massive buildings just like right next to that, which are like medical studies and research buildings as well. So they're trying to kind of make Adelaide this medical research hub. Of course, I'm always skeptical of this kind of stuff when it's coming, when it's all <laughs> right. state funded. Right. I don't see that there's any real rationalization behind it. It's just one of these things where, where it looks good on the front page of a newspaper that mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're throwing all this money at this. We're going to build a new industry in Adelaide because, you know, because all the old industries are dying, like all the car manufacturing, like Adelaide used to be big for car manufacturing. Okay. And like the uh, the Holden plant has just closed down. Holden's like GM in Australia. Okay, yeah. Or GM owns Holden. 
but that was like a big Australian car brand and they've just closed down like the big plant in Adelaide. Huh. And so, you know, and that's been the trend in Australia is all this heavy manufacturing stuff is just gone. Yeah. Just because Australia is too expensive. It's like, you know, it's, it's just labor is too expensive. Taxes are too high. There's too many regulations. Yeah. Pittsburgh um, doesn't have that problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's Pittsburgh. yeah Pittsburgh's Maybe cheap. it's changed since I've been there, but, yeah. but uh, you could get a pretty cheap house in Pittsburgh when I was going to school yeah. there. Yeah. Well, that's the thing is that Pittsburgh already had its crash a few decades ago, yeah, right? right? Right. And so, so they're kind of coming out of this trough, whereas Adelaide, they're kind of trying to head it off before it happens, uh-huh. you know, so, so everyone can kind of see the writing on the wall with all the, the manufacturing and stuff. Yeah. But that's going away. And so they're trying to develop, you know, the, the state is trying to develop the, these other industries, which I mean, I imagine something will come out of it. Like you can't throw that much money into right. like medical research and bring in all these people and, you know, sure, something will come out of it. But I just don't see that. Well, for, obviously, you know, I don't want my tax dollars paying for that because I just don't see that it's, it's going to really come to much fruition in the long run. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, all these ideas about, about, you know, do we bring in universities or do we build skyscrapers or do we build medical centers or, you know, build in- incentivized tech? I mean, yeah. all of these things, if, they, if they're allowed to happen in the marketplace, then they happen or they don't. I mean, they, if it makes sense to build a skyscraper in some place, then some developer will come in and, and they'll build a skyscraper, you know, and they'll, yeah. they'll, if there's a demand for that kind of density, then some will come in and, and do it. And, you know, and then somebody will come and build a skyscraper. And I mean, this is like the whole skyscraper curse, right? right. Somebody will come in and build it and then there'll be a crash and they'll be stuck with an empty skyscraper. Well, speaking of Adelaide, <laughs> Adelaide, the future of Adelaide, I should say the near future of Adelaide, yeah. they've built all these new residential towers all over the city. So they basically, they recently lifted a height restriction uh-huh. for buildings in the city. Yeah. I think it used to be... Oh, I want to say it was like eight stories or 10 stories or something like that. And uh-huh. they've lifted it something higher than that. Hmm. Um, so now you've got all these new resi towers popping up all over the place. Huh. And, um, you know, once those things all come out on the market, it's just going to crash the rental market. I mean, in terms of pricing, like rental pricing yeah. is going to be cheap as hell because there's going to be, you know, all this new supply. And I've hmm. heard even in places like Brisbane where they've already done this kind of build out, People are offering like free gym memberships, right? With uh, you know, with your rental. <laughs> well, oftentimes, I mean, a lot of these these buildings often do have amenities like that. At least in the states, I yeah. Mean, you have a gym. You know, some of them have like a pool. You know, they have like a movie theater, like yeah. all kind of built into the <laughs> built into the unit, um, or in, you know, into the building. But yeah, I mean, again, if and, and if that's the case, then you know, entrepreneurs either get it right or they get it wrong, and then they're the ones who suffer the losses. Where exactly. Then, where if, if, you know, the state is building some medical boondoggle and they get it wrong and they can't fill those buildings and it's just not paying for itself. Well, you know? they just keep dumping money into it. They, you know, they're like, well, we need to pay more now to hire of in course. more researchers right. to populate this building. Right. <laughs> right. So meanwhile, that's going to cost them more money. <laughs> that's driving up, you know, you'd think that that would be then on some level be driving up construction costs you know, for other projects that might be more viable. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, of course, this idea of cities densifying it certainly makes sense, but it makes sense when it's the result of market processes. When you have demand that's allowed to express itself and you have supply that's allowed to come forth to meet that demand, that allows the city to be developed in an economically responsible way and probably in a more incremental way than what you're seeing in Adelaide. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if there's any kind of, maybe the skyscraper boom is is based on some kind of perceived pent-up demand from, well, it is from these because, housing restrictions, I mean, yeah. the, the height restriction? Well, that, that's part, I mean, the height restriction is part of it, but also just the general Australian housing bubble. I mean, the, the yeah. Australian housing bubble never popped. I mean, it, it plateaued mm-hmm. in like 2008, but it never really crashed like it did in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And so it's just kept going up and up. And especially Sydney and Melbourne right now are just ridiculous. To, like you can't, you yeah. just can't buy a place in Sydney and right, Melbourne. And it's right. crazy. But I think a lot of that's even starting to roll over at the moment. I mean, I, I haven't paid much attention to it, but yeah. You know, Adelaide's kind of had this knock-on effect, you know, just because city and Melbourne are, are going up so much. It's like, well, Adelaide's kind of like that. <laughs> it's close right, to those places. Right. And so, like, you've had, I mean, there's been a lot of foreign investment and stuff, you know, just an in investment. Pro- and I think a lot of these new buildings are, a lot of them are, are explicitly marketed to, like, you know, Chinese investors mm-hmm. to come dump your money into Adelaide and, and you'll buy up all yeah. these rental properties. And then well, and that's, they're the ones who are going to lose their, lose their shirts. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, so be it. I mean, that, that was, that was yeah. a, big, a big complaint that a lot of people had in England talking about the housing crisis there is that they, they talk about, um, you know, all these foreign buyers coming in. They talk about how all these new units are just being gobbled up by foreign buyers and then yeah. they, they just sit empty. They're essentially just a, 
just a, an ATM for these right. guys to park money into yeah. because they, they don't have any good investment opportunities in, in their own country. So be it. That's kind of a result of the fact that really globally that there's a dearth of, of investment opportunities, right? Because interest rates have been so artificially low for so long that, you know, where if you have a bunch of money that you want to store in some kind of safe, responsible investment, where are you going to put that? You know, you can put it in, in government bonds of some, I mean, yeah, that's some of it, but you're getting limited returns from that. You know, you're going to put it in, in stock investments. Well, you know, yeah, sure. You put some of it, but everybody saw how risky that was back in 10 years ago now yeah. and in 2008. And again, even those returns are, are to some extent influenced by interest rates. However, if you put your money into real estate in some of these places where it's just booming, especially city centers, which as we're seeing in a lot of places, city centers are really are, are kind of going up in value almost disproportionately to other areas of, of their own country and other areas of the world and becoming, like you said, Sydney and Melbourne, just super expensive, right? Mm. So if you can kind of get on board with that as an investor yeah. and ride that wave up, then that becomes a pretty good, you know, even responsible investment, right? I mean, mm. because at least as a, with real estate, to some extent, Depending on what your time frame is, there's a floor to that value, right? I mean, like it, it's real property. Yeah. It will generally maintain some value. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, and you even should if be there's able to, a crash, and you should be able to get a rental, some sort of rental income, even if it's right. even if it's, it's not fully property. paying for itself, it's still right. better than nothing. Right. So if you're if you're some foreign investor from somewhere looking to park your money, you're going to go to a, a place with a stable economy that has skyrocketing real estate prices where you might even be able to, to borrow money, you know, yeah. <laughs> to borrow money to then kind of leverage that investment in some kind of, you know, just an apartment in a, a condo building somewhere. So I think this foreign buyer phenomenon is really just a symptom of a broader, really global system of central banks that are creating artificially low interest rates and crowding out and really reducing opportunities for investment where real estate becomes really viable as just an investment opportunity. Now, that's not to say that a lot of this construction and densification that's, that's happening in cities isn't viable. And particularly when we look at the developing world, I mean, this is where we're really seeing some serious urbanization going on. You know, they're kind of having their industrial revolution and their information revolution all at the same time in some of these countries where it's creating some strong incentives for people to leave their agricultural life and come to the city to get access to really kind of meaningful employment. That's an improvement, even though, you know, these aren't always glamorous jobs that <laughs> those of us who are privileged enough to live in places like the United States and Australia, we, you know, we might not want to be doing some of the things that people are doing in those countries. Although there are plenty of people here in the States that complain that those people are doing all the things that, <laughs> that they don't actually want to be doing in yeah. their country. But the reality is that there are job opportunities that are now opening up to a lot of these developing nations that are happening in the cities. Again, it, it's knowledge-based work. It is manufacturing work. And a lot of that urbanization is, is I think, viable. I mean, there's this, you know, this question about some of the, the ghost cities in China, right, where they're just building cities from whole cloth and they put these towers up with nobody in them. But yeah, I think there are debates out there of, are those buildings going to be filled? And I think some people say that, that you know, yeah, they will be, that, mm. that there's such a strong trend towards this urbanization that maybe by the time these things finish getting built, that the demand will be there, at least it'll come shortly thereafter. Yeah, and as all these people are moving into these cities, the way a lot of it happens is that you get these massive sort of like Brazilian favelas or slums that develop on the outskirts of the cities, which can actually be pretty fascinating in themselves, just the way these things operate. I mean, these really are sort of anarchic, bottom-up developments now. Of course, they're done with the absolute bare minimum amount of available capital. So you end up with pretty poor infrastructure and services. But at the same time, the and people... probably property rights. I mean, I would think that people are just building and building and there's, you know, right. nothing official in terms of who owns what. And so that, that's going to limit the actual investment that anybody's making in that kind of a, uh, of a development. Yeah, I have, um, I have heard some lecture about, maybe it was a TED Talk or something, about, um, you know, trying to establish some, some proper kind of property rights mm -hmm. regimes for some of these you know, people living in, in these slums and favelas and stuff. As, as homesteading, essentially? I mean, were there... Yeah, so I, I, mean, I can't really remember any of the details of it. I'll have to see if I can find it and link it on the show notes or something. Yeah. I, there's been a few lectures I've listened to about this sort of thing. But um, I mean, at the same time, though, there, there's a lot of creativity that ends up going into these things, too. And, and you know, you'd be surprised at some of the services that the people actually do end up getting, you know, where, where they 
basically steal electricity from somewhere and they power up the whole <laughs> the whole slum from some stolen electricity or from, <laughs> you know, tap into a water pipe somewhere um, or collect rainwater. Or people are definitely resourceful when they're in those situations. But, you know, of course, at the same time, there's a lot of crime and, you know, th there is a lot of poverty and all that. So it's not necessarily a great trend, you know, to have more and more of these slums developing. But I think what it is, is a sign that people are recognizing the value of living in cities and that there are more opportunities there that they can chase. And hopefully, a lot of these people are actually finding those opportunities when they do that. Yeah, and you know, I think there is a limit to the growth of cities and, and urbanization. I was listening to a talk, Stuart Brand uh, from the Long Now Foundation, which anybody who's thinking about anything having to do with the future should check out. Yeah. Uh, the idea behind the Long Now Foundation is that they're trying to think about time, right? Right. As, or our current period of time as 10,000 years into the past, which is essentially when human civilization started, right? Yeah. And 10,000 years into the future. Right. And in fact, one project they're working on is building a 10,000-year a clock. So it's a clock yeah. that will somehow last for 10,000 years, <laughs> which is a cool idea. But so they're, they're trying to promote long-term thinking and, and, and thinking about the future. But they have a series of talks, which have now made into a, into a podcast. And one of them from, from a few years back was by Stuart Brand, who is, is the organizer of at least the, the talks, and I think was involved with the founder of the organization. He was originally the, I think, the founder of the Whole Earth Catalog yeah. um, back in the 70s or whenever that yeah. was, um, but now, now is involved in this organization. All of their talks are fascinating. They're on a, a really wide range of topics. Yeah, I like to say that it's sort of like a conglomeration of you know, the world's coolest hippies with the world's coolest techies you know, all getting together, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> coming up with all kinds of crazy ideas. They have a few talks um, about cities and about urbanization. One of them was given by Stuart Brand, who, again, is, is typically hosts each of these discussions. And one point he made there, he was talking about this trend of urbanization and, and some of the demographic statistics whereby, you know, 2050, that some, you know, 80% or whatever of the world's population is going to be living in cities. But the interesting thing he said, he mentioned some, again, some kind of demographic statistical analysis where you have this phenomenon where people move to the cities, but then people who live in the cities don't have as many babies, <laughs> you know, right. they become city dwellers. They want to spend their, first of all, they're not out on the farm anymore where having kids is a benefit, right? Because then you have more people who can help you on the farm. And I'm talking about kind of poorer parts of the world, you know, developing parts of the world where it's literally, you know, all hands on tech mm. in, in some rural areas where you're going from this incentive of, of wanting to have more kids to support a more agricultural lifestyle to going to the city where there's an incentive to have less kids because you know, you want to keep more income for yourself to enjoy all the amenities that the city has to offer. And there isn't that need really to have more kids in the first place. And so the way he sees that going, and this was, these weren't his numbers, he was pulling this from somewhere else, but was that we're going to reach a turning point where, you know, we're in the process now where the human population is doubling, right? It's simultaneously doubling. And at the same time, more and more people are going to cities. But at some point, there's going to be an inflection point where you have so many people living in cities that are kind of urban city dwellers that aren't having as many kids that p those population increases are going to stop or at least slow down, that mm. there's going to be another doubling, but then that's going to be the last doubling yeah. of the human population, you know, assuming that these kind of trends continue, uh, which is it's an interesting point that, you know, we think about this, this trend towards more and more um, development, more and more urbanization, and we just imagine this you know, we imagine kind of Tokyo everywhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just city after city after city. Uh, but I think that there is kind of a feedback loop there, and there's a limit to to urbanization and to development, which is, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't know. I mean, I think it's mm. it's certainly something we're thinking about when we, when we, when we worry about um, kind of overdevelopment, this kind of Malthusian argument, you know, that we're going to... Yeah, so like instead of having this ourselves. Malthusian exponential curve, <laughs> right. you, know, you end up with more of an S-curve, uh -huh. you know, so it, it kind of starts off slow, ramps up quickly, but then levels off. Yeah. And so, yeah, and that's the sort of thing he's talked about. Which I think is a kind of a note of optimism about the future, right? Of course, you know, I, yeah, well, this is no optimist. <laughs> it, it at least eliminates the concerns of global overpopulation, the Malthusian crisis, you know? Right. I mean, there could be bumps along the way, you know, but if he's correct about that, that the population will kind of reach this natural plateau, then really at that point, it, it's not so much about growth in terms of more people and more population. The growth will come from improving standards of living for more and more people. 
Now, talking about Malthus, you know, his big concern was that you'd have this certain population that would exceed the capacity of food production. And so you'd end up with these mass starvations. So I guess it does raise a question of, okay, if the population will still be increasing and with more people living in cities. So how do you feed all these people in the cities? Now, one idea that I've seen floated is this, this idea of vertical farms, uh -huh. which is a, basically like a skyscraper greenhouse. Uh -huh. um, but it's also got all this other technology in it. So it, they've got down the bottom, like maybe in the basement, they've got like a water treatment plant mm -hmm. and where they can process all the, all the various waste. Uh -huh. And then, you know, that can produce biogas and then that can, they can use that to run a generator. <laughs> and of course, the generator can do cogeneration, which can run the digesters as well as, you know, f feed all the lights uh -huh. to, to grow all the plants. Um, you know, it, maybe it's hydroponic or something. I don't know how that all works, but um, th they might have like aquaculture in there. So they've got fish in there too. Uh -huh. Um, and they use the fish poop to fertilize the plants. Right. Um, so it's this whole completely kind of integrated thing, which is a really interesting concept. But where I think it falls down is the idea that you're going to actually have these things in the middle of a city. Right. You know, right. where first of all, you're not going to get any natural sunlight on it because it's going to be shaded by other buildings. <laughs> plus, you've got, it'll be some sort of prime real estate. So you've got this, this real estate cost, plus just the cost to build a skyscraper. You know, just all the structure and everything that you need for that. Right. Yeah. I mean, why can't you just take that same technology, the same ideas of having all the, you know, the, the digesters and the aquaculture and all that stuff mm -hmm. and lay it out horizontally mm -hmm. just outside the city in, in a farm area, you know? Right. Like, like take an area that's, that's farmland now and, you know, you, you make it a big greenhouse like that, right. you know, presuming the similar sort of economy of scale. I mean, I guess the only thing you save by having it in the city is that, you know, you could have... At the ground floor, you've got a market, which is selling all the produce from that building, you <laughs> yeah, know, totally or, right. or like some restaurants or something right. like that, which is pretty cool. I mean, I mean, it would be a very cool thing yeah. if you're a city dweller, just you have to walk up and buy a, you know, buy some fruit or something that was just grown right upstairs. I was just in the <laughs> Chicago airport, um, O'Hara last weekend, and they had this little display thing there where it's like, it's kind of like a really small scale vertical farm yeah they have these these like pvc tubes or something that have all these little um pockets in it that have little plants growing out of them one yeah. has like you know chives and parsley and stuff growing yeah. out of all these little <laughs> tubes and they have like i don't know maybe like 15 tubes in this little display thing right yeah and um and they're all you know water's all tied into them and i don't know what the how the dirt is held in them or whatever yeah. but it might just be hydroponic uh, and they have lights on them and, and yeah whatever yeah um, all these little things growing um, in the airport. And then, you know, they have a note there that says, you know, all of our crops are, are used by restaurants in the airport. You know, <laughs> I'm looking around and I'm like, okay, that's like, I'm counting like maybe 10 hamburgers here that you're putting parsley <laughs> on the side of the plate for. Yeah. And that's about it. And yeah. I'm like, thank you to grow that. So it's like, I mean, yeah, these are, they're, they're cool concepts for sure. But, yeah. but in terms of that replacing horizontal, you know, yeah. land-based agriculture, I don't see that being a, having a significant role, at least for a long time in our part of the world. Right. Maybe in places, like some place like Japan, where it's, I mean, even Japan, they have, it, There's still plenty of farmland in Japan. Exactly. You know? yeah. I mean, most, most like, I'm not going to get the numbers right here, but most developed countries, even like the U.S. or like England, I think I saw something somebody had posted about England, uh, again, about uh, related to the housing crisis or something. And he said, well, look at the percentage of land in England that's actually developed. I'm talking about human development, not agriculture, right? That's mm. kind of separate. I think it's like under 10%, right? right? It's this whole argument that, you know, you could fit everybody who I've seen this, heard this said about the United States, that you could fit every single person in the United States, um, you know, in a single family house in Texas or something, right? I, I've heard <laughs> or it's, even smaller than I, that. I think it's like, yeah, you take everyone in the world. Yeah, and, and give them it's not it's not housing, but but they could all kind of stand room to swing their arms, yeah. and it would be like yeah half of Texas or something like that, you know. So, <laughs> and the U.S. I, 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 again, I'm going to screw up the numbers here, but I think it's something like six percent is what's considered um, developed land. So you yeah. have kind of urban urban land, you have what they call like rural residential land. It's like six percent of the land, yeah. and then some like fifty percent or something I, again I'll screw up the numbers. Let's just say another fifty percent is like basically agriculture, right? Yeah. And then like another like forty something percent 
it's nothing. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's essentially undeveloped. I mean, there's land. you know, you got the mountains and you know, great the, the Rocky well, Mountains, right. which you can't right. really develop much there. I mean, right, but I mean, this idea that we're going to be crowding out the land so that we can't grow crops. Yeah. I mean, we're a long ways from that, which is say, and the, and where development's happening again, it's happening through densification. Yeah, you have yeah. some suburban, uh, some sprawl around cities, but as we're we're serving more and more people at least the current trend is that that's happening in the city so that it's not just spreading out across the land and consuming all this farmland. Of course that does happen to some extent. Yeah. Um, but at the same time you have technologies in farming. It's not quite, maybe not vertical farming, but you know, over the past, whatever, 50 years, even more, there's been all these advances in agricultural technology. Mm. They can produce, I mean, a lot more than they were able to before yeah. with less work, with less, less human labor, less energy inputs. And that's why now all these people are freed up to to go in the cities and and do um, do jobs that are kind of higher up the list of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, but there's also the, the other trend in food is um, this whole phenomenon of permaculture, yeah, which is more about finding really clever ways to kind of use what you've got on the farm. So, like nothing comes in, no inputs come in, like they don't buy in fertilizer, yeah, and no waste goes out, right? So it's it's the idea that they're trying to kind of reuse everything on the farm right and at the same time they do things in ways where they can actually get you know higher yields just using these sort of different techniques mm -hmm. for growing things and and you know rather than having these kind of rows and rows of corn or something like that in in the monoculture they've got all these different you know, they've got animals on the farm you know they've, they've got chickens fertilizing the thing and, and right. chicken tractor and, and eating, <laughs> eating bugs yeah <laughs> they've got Pigs and cows and stuff that will till up the soil. The pigs will, will you know, nose through the soil and, and right. till it up. Um, it, it's all kinds of just interesting, kind of clever ways like that, which really to me is, I mean, that that is high tech, right? In a way, you know, but it's um, it's obviously it's not you know electronic stuff, but it, it's high tech in the sense that it's it, it's finding new applications for sort of existing. Techno if you call a pig a technology, right. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's like, I do call it, pig yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and of course, the reason that we have all this monoculture and crops to begin with, at least in the U.S., a, a large part of that is due to the government subsidies for corn in particular, and I'm mm. sure things like soy and yeah. and whatever else. I mean, it, we have this whole infrastructure of monoculture crops that would fall to pieces if the subsidies were taken away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, and if that were the case, then yeah, maybe some of these guys would be able to create more permaculture. Yeah, um, the percentages I gave of the of the land use, a lot of that is essentially just feed crops for animals you know? right like yeah. it's not even like they're growing lettuce and, and you know broccoli and stuff yeah. for the rest of us <laughs> no, it's, it's all, all growing like, corn it's, it's all, all corn mostly <laughs> corn yeah and it, it, it's and a lot of it is, is really just just feed crops for for animals so it's you know yeah. it's a case to be made there that if you're concerned about you know about land use yeah <laughs> move to the city and stop eating meat i guess <laughs> <laughs> uh, or stop eating um grain-fed meat <laughs> yeah So then, of course, another important part of the built environment and of supporting all these people living in cities is how do you get stuff from the farms and the rural areas and, you know, from other countries around the world? How do you get it from there into the city to where all these city dwellers now are, are going to be using it? And I think a big part of that is going to be, again, these, these automated vehicles, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we have this model now where, you know, I have a car in my driveway, you know, you have a, a car on the wrong side of your driveway. Yep. And every, you know, everybody has a car to get themselves where they need to go, or people have two cars to get where they need to go. If you need groceries, you get in your car, you go to the store, you get groceries. If you need clothes, you get in your car, you drive to the store, you buy the clothes you need or whatever. Of course, some of that has started to change with things like Amazon, you know, of course, all the online shopping that's going on. I'm sure that's something that will continue to increase. You know, and right now all these all these packages that you order online, you know, we have like three times a day. There's delivery guys showing up yeah. here. <laughs> there goes CPS truck right now, right? There goes. <laughs> <laughs> you drive the dog nuts, but but right now you have all these things being driven around through these delivery systems that are, you know, I'm sure they're pretty sophisticated in terms of the way that they're getting things from one point to another. I mean, I imagine that you think about smart networks and smart mm. smart uh, grids and smart transportation networks. I mean. If anybody's on top of that, it's these logistics companies, you know, yeah. the UPS and the FedEx and DHL or whatever. <laughs> I mean, these guys have that figured out, at least for their own independent network, how they're going to get things from point A to point B. But when you start thinking about automated vehicles, I think that can be a game changer for the way that things are distributed 
where if I want some groceries, maybe I tell my car, hey, go to the grocery store and get my groceries. And, you know, there are services like here we have like a Peapod, I think it's by Stop and Shop. Or something. All these grocery stores now are coming up with these grocery delivery services where you go online and put in an order and a truck shows up and a guy, you know, unloads a few bins of, of groceries. And we've done that before and it's, it's, it's been pretty great. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that that is something, you know, not just for groceries, but for a lot of things where where you don't have to go to the grocery store necessarily to mm. get all your groceries. I mean, the grocery store is one of the last things where I think a lot of people are resistant to ordering, you know, lettuce online. Right, <laughs> right? yeah, because you're already you're going to get the one, like, rotten right. bunch in the thing. Right, of course, <laughs> and we, we've had good luck with it. And, and, of course, if you have a problem with it, you just call them up and they take it off your order. Yeah. You know, it's no big deal. Maybe you have to then go back to the store and buy the lettuce that you need for yeah. your recipe. But, I mean, I see, I see that being a probably a, an increasing trend. And, in fact, I've even heard people say that, that it's more efficient, it's more energy efficient, you know, better for the planet right. to shop that way rather than people making all these trips back and forth yeah. to all these different shops. It's better to purchase a thing online and have it delivered because that whole delivery network is much more efficient yeah. than yeah. hopping in your that car. One, that one truck will come and make five stops down your street in one trip. Right. But so the interesting thing comes in when you start thinking about automated vehicles is it am I just sending my car to the grocery store to get my groceries and bringing it back? Yeah. If I have a package, is that being filtered through this whole network of planes and trucks and everything until it gets to my house? Or is there just some kind of a drone, an automated drone yeah. that goes to the, the factory and picks it up and, you know, whether it's flies or uses the road network or whatever, <laughs> just drives it to my house and, you know, drops it off in my automated mailbox yeah. <laughs> that's in my front yard. You think about how that can start to change the infrastructure, not only that, but then all those deliveries and things can start to happen off hours. You know, that stuff can happen. Right in the middle of the night. So you have people on the roads during the day mm. and at nighttime you have all the deliveries happening, Yeah, which, you know, I guess is a long haul truckers kind of do nowadays to some extent, but you can imagine that happening. Well, especially in cities. Right. You know, right. like these days you go to a city and you got delivery trucks double parked all over the place, blocking roads and everything in the middle right. of the day. Just right. Because they've got the delivery guy that's unloading it. <laughs> yeah. You someone know. was just telling me that in some cities, you have like a FedEx truck. They put a, a like a, a mailbox that like you put on the side of your house. Yeah. They put a mailbox on the side of the FedEx truck, and the city comes and they just put all the parking tickets into the mailbox. <laughs> they collect up all the parking tickets, yeah. and like at the end of the month, you know, there's some parking ticket manager or something yeah. <laughs> at the FedEx office. They call up the city and they negotiate some price for all the parking tickets that they've accumulated. Yeah, and another thing I've heard with automated cars and parking is that. You could have an automated car basically drop you off at your office in the morning and then either drive all the way back home and come pick you back up in the afternoon or drive to some sort of parking facility outside the city limits. So what that does is it actually frees up a lot more space where you don't need to have all this car parking space in the middle of the city and that could free up a lot more space for either residential or office space, which would be far more valuable than car parks. Yeah, and some people are even have plans now to develop parking garages specifically for automated vehicles because they can be kind of smaller and, and you know, have smaller spots because you don't yeah. have a, people need to get in and out of the doors. Right. And, you know, the cars are better. <laughs> Maybe they're better at parking. Yeah. Than, uh, It'll those, be like those Japanese people. ones where they, they have the elevators well, and stuff too, and they just yeah. pack them in. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, like a <laughs> filing cabinet for all these cars. Yeah, but car the other, the other thing. You know, when you think about that, it's like, well, why do these cars need to park at all? And we've kind of touched on this already, but these cars can just keep driving around and picking people up. Again, it can be like more like an, especially in a city, yeah. you know, like an Uber kind of a thing where the cars don't need to park. They just keep cir circulating around and picking up passengers. I mean, yeah, sure, some of them are going to get out of town and, and go park for the day. But it raises the question of if you have all these automated vehicles that can pick you up and drop you off, why do you want to own one of them? You know? Right. If all you need to do is push a button on your phone and five minutes later, one of these things shows up, you mm. know, in your front yard and you go and hop in it and get to work. And maybe even along the way, it, you know, it picks up more passengers. So it splits the cost of, of that ride, however that works. Or maybe they take you, you know, we haven't really talked much about, about transit yet, but one of the things that's, that stinks about transit is, of course, you need to get to these certain spots where you have your transit hubs or right. your stations to get onto the line. And then sometimes you have to make multiple stops to actually get from your house, you know, to where you're going, to your office or whatever. And half the time, it's not the travel time that's really a pain. It's the multiple stops, you know, the multiple modes of transport that make transit just that much more of a headache for people that they don't want to do it. But you can imagine if it's 
more individualized automated vehicles, let's say one comes to your house and picks you up and then takes you to some kind of, you know, more intermodal transfer station. And, you know, maybe there's, yeah, maybe there's still trains and things you get on from there. Or maybe it's just essentially like a park and ride, but with all these automated vehicles Mm. so that you get there and you're one little vehicle that took you from your house. And as you get closer to the city, now you're hopping into a bigger automated vehicle that's shared with other people. And maybe if, you know, you're somebody who needs privacy in your, <laughs> in your pod, maybe they even have individual, it's like, a, I'm thinking like a train of these automated cars yeah. <laughs> that all go together or, you know, just something that has some separated compartments so that people who want to sit and, and make phone calls and, and do some office work, you can imagine almost like a cubicle on wheels, you know, yeah. you have like, <laughs> a, right. maybe you have like an 18 wheeler that's just packed with kind of cubicles that <laughs> people are hopping in and an RV and working on on their way into work so that it's reducing the cost for those commuters. You know, maybe they have that transfer when they get from their first vehicle into the second vehicle, but hopefully these things are just ready to go and you're not waiting for a driver to go back and forth. You know, you can imagine that if you have more vehicles that are available and that are just kind of circulating through the system, that maybe those wait times are reduced so it makes that more viable. Yeah, well, they could also have more dynamic routes instead of having these sort of static, you know, bus loops and and bus routes and and obviously rails are are pretty static routes. Mm -hmm. You know, they could really be more adaptable. You don't need to have a bus circulating all the way around the city if there's no one for it to pick up or stopping at every stop. Right. So you could see with this sort of a system where... Again, if people are dialing up rides on their phones or whatever, that the uh, the system could be much more adaptive to people's actual needs on a given day. Now, one potential downside with this sort of thing is if you've got automated cars dropping everybody off and then driving back out of town at the same time instead of parking, then it could potentially double the number of cars on the road during peak hour. But if it does lead to more carpooling and more versatile transit solutions, then there could ultimately be a net benefit and a net reduction in the number of cars on the road. Yeah, and even if there is an increase in the number of cars on the road, you know, if if what we're saying is true and you can reduce parking in cities, you know, if cars don't need to be parking out on the street in front of buildings, half of the roads in cities are just taken up by parked cars, right? Right. <laughs> so you can imagine that even if you eliminate the parking on one side of the road in any given area, that could free up a whole nother travel lane. Yeah, well, and not to mention, you know, and every single person that's just that stops in the middle of the road to back into a spot is right. stopping all the traffic behind them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. For at least 30 seconds or whatever, however long it takes them to park. Yeah. And again, maybe with some efficiencies and like we talked about earlier at intersections and things, you could just imagine this whole network of vehicles possibly moving more smoothly yeah. around the city. It takes you back to the whole induced demand problem where once you're able to have more cars on the road then does the demand just increase to to meet that and then you're just stuck back yes you're getting more people into the city yeah um and increasing kind of the density of activity in the city which is a good thing but at the end of the day does it make the traffic any better (laughs) um you just have more people who are able to to participate in that but they're still going through some of the headaches of, of city traffic right yeah but that's i mean Ultimately, that's the purpose of the city is to have, have more people using it, you know, and creating more of that kind of network effect that we discussed earlier. Right. And now, of course, there is a solution to all this, you know, crowding of vehicles on city roads, which is, of course, the flying, flying cars, cars, which listeners of ours will know that we have determined is really the solution to everything. Yeah, it's pretty simple. So I think we've reached a point in this podcast when we can finally start talking seriously about, <laughs> about the real solution, <laughs> which is the real solution. <laughs> so here's the thing. So first of all, there are companies out there now who are trying to develop flying cars and trying to work with regulators <laughs> to get the FAA to approve them and everything. And there's a line by, I think it was Peter Thiel, who said that, you know, we wanted... We all wanted flying cars, and we got 140 characters. We got 280 now. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Things are looking up. Yeah, the world's improving. But you know, the point being that this idea of flying cars is something that's that's been in the human psyche. You know, probably going back to the Jetsons, <laughs> maybe before <laughs> then. But Rin Tin Tin wasn't that a flying car or something? Sure. Or no, no, it was a, it was a uh, what's the one? Not Flubber. Um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Yeah, that's right. That's what it was. So it stands to reason that you know somebody should be able to come up with, you know, and maybe we're not there yet with our with, with engineering technology. You engineers need to get work on that, Joe. Eh, 
But it stands to reason that at some time in the future, maybe even in our lifetimes, there will be <laughs> there will be flying cars. Yeah, I mean there are prototypes out there now. Yeah, but yeah, obviously, I mean, I think the automated car, you know, the automated vehicle thing, is sort of a necessary prerequisite to flying cars because I, I can't see flying cars working with human pilots. No, I agree. It's never gonna happen. Absolutely right? agree. Yeah. <laughs> But if, if it's all automated, you know, once people gain that trust in, in automated vehicles, you can basically just take your automated vehicles and give them another dimension to travel in. I can see that being much more viable and much more palatable to most people. And of course, this has a, a ton of implications for the built environment. Mm. I mean, for one thing, if you think about people coming into a city from on high, mm. it could literally flip the city upside down where you start having all these public spaces now what are essentially now on the rooftops, you know, or maybe you have some kind of uh, landing pads or infrastructure and things that get built up at, at upper levels within dense cities so that it creates an, an entirely new plane of public space. Well, and then streets can become streets again, at least in the sort of sense that people like Jane Jacobs and some of the urbanist types understood them, which is really the street is kind of the public space where all the action happens in the city. Mm -hmm. You know, where you've got people walking, you've got markets and all that sort of stuff happening. So really, if you essentially get all the cars off the road and up into the air, then the streets all become public spaces. Yeah. And, and I, I would imagine that even with <laughs> with flying cars, that they're not going to be, you know, you, you probably fly to a point and come down and there'll be kind of landing zones and things so that these things aren't just dropping out of the sky left and right, mm. <laughs> especially in a dense city. I would think that in, in dense cities, you're still going to have these cars kind of driving along the roads, but maybe it's not so much the crosstown traffic. Maybe it's just the really kind of local traffic that you come to some kind of landing node and you, you land in your flying car. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you're traveling on the road to wherever you need to be. And, you know, again, if, if these things are automated, maybe people don't own their flying car. Maybe this is a, it's all more of a service yeah. um, where these things are, are circulating, picking people up and dropping them off. You know, then maybe that's, that starts to solve the parking issue too, because maybe these things can just kind of go back up into the sky and just hover up there until somebody <laughs> needs them. And actually in Sao Paulo, Brazil right now, there are a lot of people who actually commute by helicopter and a hmm. lot of the buildings have helipads on top hmm. and because the traffic's so bad there. And so, so you can already kind of see a bit of this. Of course, it's, you know, I think you've got to be a bit of a high roller to be able to afford that every day. But it's, it's a thing, you know, they have these helicopter taxis in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Hmm. So it's, it's not unheard of for this sort of transit to happen. But, you know, on a mass scale, it would, it would certainly have some bigger implications for the rest of the city. Yeah, and you know, one thing that, that might be kind of a game changer for flying cars is the question of energy. You know, where are they getting their energy from? You know, at this point, I'm guessing that a lot of these are essentially using combustion engines um, where they have to carry up not only their occupants, but also their, all their liquid fuel. You know, and of course, every bit of weight that you add to a flying car makes it that much harder for the thing to get off the ground. Yeah, well, um, it makes it consume that much more energy when it's traveling. Right, it to right. To stay afloat. So you can imagine if that, if we could get to some point where energy can be stored much more compactly, or can be generated, you know, on the vehicle itself. If we're talking about some kind of, I guess, advanced form of solar power, right? A little nuke reactor or something like that. <laughs> mini, mini micro nuke. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's some tipping point there where, you know, once a battery gets compact enough, or or once they have some kind of <laughs> nuclear reactors flying all over the city, <laughs> <laughs> driven by the AI enabled <laughs> robots, <laughs> who we're just hoping don't become self-aware. Yeah. What could yeah. possibly go wrong? Yeah, but we do see a lot of development in especially the field of batteries and, and energy storage at the moment, you know, which could lead to some of these sort of game-changing new technologies. And if we're talking more broadly about a world of abundant energy, now that would most likely come from a mix of sources. So you have solar, wind, you know, all the green energies. I think you'd still have fossil fuels in the mix in some capacity. And of course, there's always options for nuclear as well including technologies like thorium reactors, which is supposed to be a lot cleaner and the fuel is supposed to be a lot more abundant than it is for uranium. Hmm. But for whatever reason, there just hasn't been as much development on that. Maybe it's one of these things that just conspiracy theorists get hung up on. <laughs> but what I've heard is that um, you know, the reason they went with uranium reactors way back when was because then they could use the byproducts for that to make nuclear weapons. Right. <laughs> but with thorium, you can't do that because for whatever reason, whatever the products are, aren't as reactive which is actually, you know, what you want if you're right. generating energy. <laughs> but I think the trend that we're seeing right now is a lot more decentralized power generation, 
whether it's even fossil fuel generation, which is the sort of stuff that I work with, which is you know embedded generation in buildings, as well as things like landfill gas, biogas, and even cogeneration, where instead of having these big centralized generators, you have a much more decentralized grid. Um, and we talked about this a little bit in episode four. But when you've got, you know, say every house in town has solar panels on the roof, maybe a little wind turbine up on, on top of the roof, and then a battery storage system, and the stuff's all connected to the grid and all feeding back into the grid, you can see how you could get a pretty robust and stable generation system. And there's actually some of these, what they're calling now, I think they call it a virtual grid or something like that, mm-hmm. where it's essentially all these sort of small generators, you know, like household scale generators. And some company will come in, like a power company will come in and essentially combine all the grid input from all these groups into one, oh no, virtual power plant is what they call it. And they treat that as if that's all coming from one centralized power plant in terms of billing and stuff. And and so there's all this, and then there's all these other kind of what they call behind the meter schemes where, you know, let's say you're generating power on your roof and you could agree to sell it to your neighbor across the street. And somehow you work it out with the electric company that, you know, he pays you. Hmm. or in Bitcoin or something like that. There's a lot, of this, a lot of this blockchain sort of stuff that's coming up at the moment. Hmm. And that way, you know, you get around a lot of these kind of transmission fees and that sort of stuff. And you see that happening a lot in, in let's say, an apartment building where maybe they've got some solar panels on the roof and then everyone in the building is kind of buying power from the building owner or something, you know, behind the meter. Yeah, I mean, and, and there are a lot of ways to do that now. To, we had somebody come in our new house we just bought recently Mm. We had someone come and look at the roof to put solar panels up here because, you know, we, we made out so well on, the, on our last house, yeah. as we talked about in episode four. And our roof here is OK. But what the guy said is he said, well, you know, what we can do is we can offer you you can buy a share of essentially a solar farm right. that they're putting in some farm field somewhere, you know, somewhere nearby. But essentially, it's, you know, you're basically buying the same panels that we would put up on a roof, but they're just going somewhere where they can produce energy more efficiently and be installed more efficiently and more cost effectively right. than trying to get them up on on our roof. So it's essentially the same. Well, I guess it's a little bit different in the, the way that you the ownership structure, but you're getting the same benefit for basically the same amount of money that you would from installing these things in your roof. Yeah. And you know, another interesting technology around that is something people are working on now is is having roofing materials that are themselves solar. You know, generating solar power. Yeah. So you have shingles and maybe metal panel roofs that are photovoltaic and can be tied into an inverter and, and power your house or power the grid or whatever. So you can imagine that if that becomes much more cost effective, you know, if everybody on your block, even people don't have great solar exposure, if everybody's reshingling their roofs with <laughs> some kind of photovoltaic shingle, yeah. you know, you can imagine the kind of coverage you could get from that. Or, you know, some people talk about taking roads and doing some kind of a uh, yeah that's not going to happen take, they got that's not going to happen when you think about i've seen some stuff about that's so when they're thinking like you know look at all that crap that gets dropped off of cars oh yeah onto the road now i know oh, maybe, maybe okay. once you're using electric cars and stuff and you <laughs> you've got go. cleaner oil lube oils and stuff like that the that, cars will just pl- will just like have like a, it'll be like those those little race car sets you used to have <laughs> where you pull the trigger and it's like the little pin that sits on the metal track and it goes <laughs> flying around a figure eight it'll be like that you'll just have a little metal pin that'll drag along the road yeah. <laughs> and suck up the power from the uh, from the photovoltaic road <laughs> yeah no i don't see that happen with the roads it, it's the same sort of thing where it's like they're gonna just get beat up you know with all the weight of the car it's just yeah yeah looks good on paper on a very first sketch but as soon as you start doing any of the engineering behind it it's like no this is just stupid <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's no point but flying cars though that's got legs they don't even need legs <laughs> <laughs> except for landing <laughs> But another thing that could happen with all these, assuming that everyone transitions to some sort of electric cars or something like that, is that you've got a bunch of electric cars which are you know, charging up with their solar panels during the day. But then when they're not being used, they could plug into the grid and the battery in the car could actually be used as a battery bank to feed back into the grid as well. So instead of having the stationary battery plugged into the side of your house, you've got the battery in your car, which you come home at night, you park it in the driveway, and it charges half the night. But when you're sitting there watching TV, you know, it can be feeding into your house as a battery. But isn't the point of the battery to keep the power for the car? Oh, what happens car then car. when you have to like go to the store? Then your back car battery well, is your rush I mean, TV. you got to ask the AI who's going to be figuring that all out for you. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, what was the, did you still then have to charge the battery of the car? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the car battery would still be charged, but it, it would do some peak off peak management. Oh, so okay, that, okay. You yeah. know, it's not going to be charging during the peak time. During peak times during the day when you're sitting at work, it could be feeding back 
some of that power into the into the grid. Oh, I see. So then the and benefit then, of that of that of that is that then it's kind of smoothing out the the grid. That right. It's, it's it's reducing the peak demand. And, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Must be a hell of a battery. Dude. Well, <laughs> but it's all you know, it's it's not different than any other battery really. And, and and all these you got all these cars that would be doing the same thing. Yeah. So you essentially have this massive battery bank that's available throughout the day. And again, it's all decentralized. Another interesting solution I read at one point about, you know, with batteries, because one of the concerns with an electric car with a battery is what happens when the battery runs out, then you have to sit there for four hours with the thing charges again. Yeah, I mean, they do have like these quick charging stations that Tesla or whoever is developing. I think they can charge it in like 30 minutes or something really? like that. But still, I mean, well, you don't want to sit at a gas station for 30 minutes charging your car. <laughs> and that's, that's actually part about how long it takes me when, I, when we're on a long trip and we stop yeah. at a gas station with the kids and everybody's got to get out and right. go to the bathroom and, you know, get a snack. So, yeah, I guess that's viable. But what I was going to say is that assuming that these batteries get small enough for these vehicles that you could even have the possibility of you go to a gas station or I guess it wouldn't be gas anymore. And just swap out the battery, right? right? So if your battery's trained, maybe these things can be interchangeable. And you, you swap it out, put a new battery in, and keep going. And you can imagine that kind of a battery being pretty versatile so that, yeah, maybe you come back home and you plug it into your house. And maybe you've got, you know, four of them, this battery bank of these things that charge your house. And it's all modular. And, you know, maybe you just have kind of one type of battery that right. <laughs> charges that, that can... <laughs> One one battery to rule them all. It's like this power tool set that I have. You know, I've got the one eighteen <laughs> volt battery, and it charges yeah. like ten different tools. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking more like the uh, what's remember in Transformers they had like the power cube, the that energon like makes all the Transformers work. <laughs> yeah, the energon. <laughs> That's what we need. We need the energon. Now Transformers, <laughs> they're coming. <laughs> Speaking of the future, <laughs> right. Now, they're already among us. We just don't know it. Oh, I guess so, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I've actually seen a lot of cars around with the little Decepticon thing on the back or Autobot, so mm. obviously they're Transformers. <laughs> Clearly, they're among us. They are robots in disguise, let's remember. So one facet of this that we haven't really gotten into yet is the technology of the construction industry itself and how that's going to be changing. We're starting to see some really interesting technologies developing right now, such as 3D printed buildings or some of these sort of modular buildings that are almost kind of self-assembling. I've seen this stuff where they can build a skyscraper in China in like 30 days or something like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's all, it's all <laughs> kind of manufactured off site with cabling in the walls and everything. Yeah. And it all just kind of snaps together on site. And you yeah. know, they've got this 30 stories skyscraper. And it only takes about another 30 days for it to collapse back down to the earth. <laughs> No, those videos are amazing. Yeah, I've seen at least one of those before, and it is pretty amazing. And there is a, definitely a strong trend towards modular construction, where you have more or less of the building being constructed off-site in a controlled environment, and then being delivered out to the building site and assembled and put together. In some cases, it could be you know structural pieces. You know, of course, there's modular homes, and in almost any city you go to now, you can see these modular apartment buildings where they have what are essentially like a like a trailer, you know, like a, maybe a... Containers. A, like yeah, containers almost like a or, container. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, but it, it's a modular, you think of like a modular home, right? Right. It's like that, but they just stack these things up on top of each other, like a set of Legos. Yeah. And then, you know, they can put more or less of the finishes into them, the finishes and then things like plumbing fixtures and everything. You know, some of these things, they can build all that stuff in in the factory, get it out on site, drop them into place. And then just have to go through and make some connections and maybe just do some wiring and just run a header up the back plumbing side pipes or something and like that. There's still some, of course, some core infrastructure that you need to build in yeah. on site and do some things to, to tie them all together. But there are some interesting approaches out there to modular construction that's allowing these things to be done off site. And of course, in a city where it's really hard to maintain a construction site in a dense, busy city, this is something that could be a real advantage for construction. If you can come in and almost drop the building in place yeah. <laughs> and minimize your time on the site, not to mention that when you're constructing these things offsite in a controlled environment, you have much more quality control, kind of less room for error. A lot more processes can be standardized and it's a lot safer for the workers. Another technological advancement in construction is maybe if an entire building isn't modular, you're having certain components of the building that can be constructed in a modular fashion or one thing i'm thinking of is, is that there's a technology out there now for bricklaying robots <laughs> where you have this little robot arm that can you know butter a brick and 
pop it in a place in the building. Of course, it can make the thing, you know, perfectly square yeah. across the face of the building, square and level. And if you've ever seen a real mason work, I mean, there's, there's a real art and craft to it. Yeah. And uh, I love watching masons work because it's usually like these big, you know, heavy, burly guys, big, strong dudes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they go over and they pick up, you know, a concrete block and drop it into place on the wall. And then they take like a little hammer, they go, tick, tick, tick. <laughs> get the thing perfectly aligned and into yeah. place and you know they're they're again real real kind of artisans yeah but when you have a large expanse of masonry there are some robots out there now who can do that and i don't know if it's cost effective at this point versus hiring real masons and laborers i'm sure the unions are all up in arms about it no, yeah. no, good riddance <laughs> but you can imagine more and more of that happening and then, of course, you mentioned 3D printed buildings where you have, again, components of the building that are created by 3D printers. You know, one thing this starts to do is it starts to really free up the possibilities for design. A lot of construction materials these days are kind of flat and square, and, you know, that's, what, that's what's easy to produce and to ship. But if you can start to have materials that are printed on site, you know, think of like a metal panel on the side of the building. Yeah. If that exterior wall panel can be printed on site, then there's really no restriction on on that being a flat or a square panel. And you can start to have much more organic and idiosyncratic forms that can be used to form and shape the building. I mean, obviously everything has to still has to work structurally and <laughs> and perform, you know, with the elements. Yeah, but that can all be calculated. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, does this have to be designed and engineered? But, you know, of course, I'm thinking again of, you know, of course the Hadid architects. Yeah. They actually develop some of this technology. You know, they work with engineering and manufacturing companies to really kind of push the boundaries of what they can do to try to to construct the kind of forms that they come up with in their designs you know these these kind of wild curvilinear shapes at some point you could have instead of these massive tower cranes that have to be installed and maintained during the course of a construction you could have drones flying stuff up to whatever level they need to go to (laughs) on a site (laughs) which could actually be a lot, you know, when you think about all these kind of crane fires and crane collapses and stuff that happen, and they cause a lot of damage when they do, it could be a much safer solution if, <laughs> if, the, if the drones are all right. <laughs> yeah, drone, drones hauling the building materials around doesn't seem dangerous at all. What could possibly go wrong. <laughs> no, but I mean, again, it would be all, it would be all kind of automated, you know, so, so the thing would right. be, I mean, you can take a drone now and you can program a route for it, and it'll fly up, and it, they're like dead precise. Oh, know? yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, you know, someone's still got to load all that stuff onto the drone. And Get I robots to do that. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. Take out the human element. <laughs> if there are no humans on the site to drop things on, then who really cares? <laughs> right. But you could have, you know, you could have different drones that are kind of specialized for lifting different sorts of things. You know, instead of having the one hook for everything, uh-huh. you could have drones with different sort of rigs or harnesses or whatever that they can attach to the bottom to lift up you know, specialized pieces of equipment or whatever. <laughs> or what you could do is, is rather than building a building from the ground up, mm. you know, maybe you construct a floor level at grade and then you have a drone on either side, either corner of the building. <laughs> they lift the whole building up and you build the next floor underneath it. And just, <laughs> well, I just saw this, that way. <laughs> I just saw a thing on Twitter or something yesterday where it was, it was kind of, sort of the opposite of that. They were somewhere in Japan, they were demolishing a building. And what they did is they, they had some sort of jacks that they put up like at the ground level, and then they'd knock out the whole first floor, hmm. and these jacks would lower down. <laughs> the whole building would come down by one level. <laughs> they'd do the same thing, put the jacks back in, knock out the second floor, and bring the whole thing down. <laughs> so yeah. it's demolition, you know, without any action, anything really falling. It all happens at ground level. <laughs> so yeah, you kind of see maybe the opposite of that happening, I guess. If these jacks are strong enough to lower a building, then yeah, I get it. You know, they could, to be they a... could raise one, raise it too. <laughs> I guess so. You can think of other applications for robots on construction sites. I mean, one, a simple one is just something like doing site visits, you know, where you have a VR and you might have a little drone that flies around the site and can scan all the dimensions, you know, build up a sort of an actual 3D model of what's going on on site, as well as give you a video feed and everything. So that way you're not, you're not having guys come out to the site doing site visits every two weeks or week or... Hey, hold on, hold on. That, that's my <laughs> livelihood you're talking about here. Don't kill the job. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're going to be, this is making you more productive. <laughs> you're the one who's going to have this technology. You're going to be leading the, leading the field. Yeah, there are. And it's become commonplace now on construction sites for, for them to have, for the contractors to set up, um, you know, maybe a couple of cameras around the site yeah. so that anybody on the project team can take a look and see how the building is progressing. They'll, they'll sometimes set up a website where they have almost a live feed of what's happening on the site. And it might not be a live video, but it's, you know, maybe every 10 seconds or every 30 seconds the thing updates so that you, yeah. you get a sense of how it's progressing. And there are also technologies to, like you just said, you can get a camera now that you put in the middle of a room and it will do a 3D scan of the room. And you can even go around 
tie a bunch of these 3D images together and create, yeah, a full 3D model of the building. You wonder if something like that could even like do the opposite too and almost print the design onto the walls and stuff so like you know, the contractors can see where each outlet has to go or where, hologram where each... holographic architecture. <laughs> oh yeah holographic design <laughs> yeah <laughs> we've done you know we often do what we call a mock-up room especially in a healthcare project mm-hmm. you'll have like an exam room where you go in there with the nurses and the doctors and we say okay you know this is how we have it laid out you get some cardboard boxes and you say this is going to be your cabinet over here yeah. where your sink is <laughs> sometimes they'll bring in real furniture like they bring in a real exam table yeah. they'll bring in some of the other like a floor lamp or whatever else they have um, in the space and then we'll put pieces of cardboard out. I- i've printed out before like sets of outlets and things that have you know <laughs> maybe the medical gases and yeah. the switches and the, and the power outlets emergency power and we print out all these little things just on paper or sometimes we put them on cardboard and we go around and we stick them on the wall yeah. uh, where we want them to be within one of the rooms that the contractor has started to construct. And that way they can go in and really get a sense for how that room's going to work. And sometimes you say, oh, no, let's, uh, let's move these med gases over six inches this way because, you know, the, the vacuum canister is going to hit this, this wire or whatever. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> it's just something we've, we've done for a long time. Mm. But, yeah, you can imagine that started to happen more digitally. I guess you need to have some kind of projector, <laughs> right? Some kind of a 3D projector <laughs> yeah. to project some images. Well, and, yeah, a projector or, you know, some little drone that goes around and just, like, prints onto the wall or something well like let me okay an so, image onto the so, wall. <laughs> so no this is what what's actually happening is you have vr now right so you have vr where you can or augmented reality i guess where you can be in the space and be looking around the space and you know turn on the vr and you can see the design you can see what's designed yeah as you're looking around the space that you're framing up right so that's really i think where that's going is that there is going to be a, a strong use for virtual reality on the construction site <laughs> Yeah, and VR is interesting too because it could get to a point where it's like, well, what's the point of building that space in the first place? <laughs> you can just visualize it virtually if the quality gets good enough. You know, so it could be that rather than building out, especially office space, you know, a hospital or something, obviously you need a special kind of facility with certain amenities and you, know, you got to have your oxygen in the walls and that sort of stuff. But for just an office cubicle, you know, do you really need that space or will you end up with more people, like we kind of discussed earlier, working from home? telecommuting and then whenever they have a meeting everyone just pops on their vr goggles and they're all sitting around a virtual conference table together right you know yeah that's i mean it gets us back to this question about the kind of the urbanization versus suburbanization you know if everybody can start having all the and not just not just a work experience but all kinds of experiences yeah you know in in virtual reality and it's not just the the visual image but some people are even working on like like haptic suits you know these suits right. you put on they give you kind of touch sensations or like a, some kind of a little platform that you stand on that gives you the sensation that you're yeah. you know jumping or falling or it's whatever like, was it the lawnmower man was it the old <laughs> Stephen king movie <laughs> right <laughs> i mean yeah there's certainly promise there and i think that that's definitely coming i mean i think that you know our generation was a generation that was comfortable working on computers, you know, whereas the generation before us really had to learn and adapt to, to using computers, but we kind of grew up with them a bit. So, you yeah. know, not just computers, video games, and it became kind of natural for us to work and to communicate using computers. For the generation that's growing up now, I think that's going to be true of phones, right? <laughs> right. iPhones. And tablets and all that. Right. And so generation after this, my kids will probably be growing up with much more exposure to virtual reality. And of course, you know, virtual reality opens up a whole avenue of ways of interaction, ways of working, ways of communicating, ways of being entertained, you know, ways of of kind of exploring the world that could really be a game changer. It could really kind of change people's preferences in terms of where they want to be, how they want to spend their time, what they want to be doing. So it definitely begs the question of, you know, what does that mean for the city? Again, it's why, why are people going and living in cities? And does virtual reality start to take away that rationale? Yeah, I mean, my gut feeling is that there's still going to be sort of a movement for authenticity, for, for authentic experiences. You know, I mean, when you look at any kind of major tour site, like, you know, you can go, you can see pictures of the Grand Canyon, you can see videos of the Grand Canyon. You can even go on Google Earth now. Yeah. A lot of like, like kind of tourist places, you can go in and they have somebody who walked, who like strapped a camera on their head. Right. And will like walk around, like walk a whole trail in the Grand Canyon. Right. Or the best one I found, my son was really into Google Earth for a little while while we were traveling. We would look at all the places we were traveling yeah. on his iPad. 
But the coolest one we found is that you can go on Google Earth to Cape Canaveral, you know, the, I guess the Kennedy Space Center, right. and you can go in the launch tower where they launch the rockets. You can like walk all the way up through the whole thing, <laughs> wow. like, see all the levels of, of the launch tower, uh, yeah. you know, where they, where they launch space shuttles. Yeah. Um, so there are kind of cool experience, you know, th that idea of having the simulated experience is out there and similar like like you know something like the great pyramids you can walk all around the great pyramids on google right. earth yeah but people i think people really value that authenticity the, the real experience you know they want to be able to buy the t-shirt you know take it home oh i went to the the great pyramids you know it's almost yeah. a, a status thing i mean i don't know whether vr will change that drive at all but i think i think it'll still be there you know people want to have real experiences don't they <laughs> yeah no and i'm not i'm not i'm being devil's advocate here yeah. I, I think in general i agree with you and not only that but i think that with vr that with virtual reality, when we're all having all these simulated experiences all the time, I think that need and that desire for authenticity is going to become even more potent, right? I right. mean, you're going yeah. to really want to feel like there's a world out there that you can get engaged with, that you can get away from that, that simulated world, especially as that, as, as that gets associated with the way people are working. You know, if you're, right. if you're sitting in, I guess you're not sitting in your office, but you're sitting in your lawnmower man recliner, you know, <laughs> eight hours a day doing work, whatever kind of work you're doing. Right. The last thing you want to do at the end of the day is put on your VR goggles and go off to some, you know, <laughs> magical fantasy land. Yeah. <laughs> what you want to do is see your kids and go outside and, you know, walk in the woods or you enjoy know. the real world. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think that VR could possibly have this effect of making people want to re-engage in the physical world. And I think that probably bodes well for cities because a big part of the reason people want to live in cities is to have these kind of authentic experiences, right? Yeah. You know, to go to a great restaurant or to see the, these amazing historical buildings and to interact with real people and, you know, just even just sitting on the street and, and kind of people watching or, yeah, or shopping or yeah, shopping you know. or seeing some street performance or, or something like that. Yeah. I mean, these are the kind of authentic experiences that people crave and that, and that cities provide. That's really a big part of the reason why people want to be in cities. It's not just, I mean, of course, it is kind of being close to where you work. But I think in general, virtual reality can start to, and all these other technologies we're talking about, it can start to allow people to live where they want. So maybe they're less tied down by where they work. So they might choose to live in the city or people who prefer you know, nature can choose to live more in the countryside or you know, by a ski mountain or by a lake or by the ocean or whatever. Virtual reality might help to free people up if it becomes a standard way of working and, and of people interacting with each other. And people might be more free to live where they want. And the truth is that I think a lot of people will still want to live in cities and that cities will continue to grow and to thrive for all the reasons that they do now. Yeah. And of course, here we are, you know, Tim and I sitting right next to each other doing this podcast for the first time ever. <laughs> right. <laughs> when, you know, we've normally done it virtually, but, you know, to me, this is a much better experience and we're probably having a much more natural conversation than we normally do. Which if you ever heard our raw tracks, you know, that's not saying much. <laughs> but I mean, the reason I'm here is because you know, a friend of mine's getting married. And so obviously I want to be there at that event with them. Like we had our 20th high school reunion recently. Mm -hmm. And so I dialed in on FaceTime for that and kind of like, you know, passed the iPad around. I couldn't hear what anyone was saying and nobody could hear me. But, you know, so, so you could do that stuff virtually, but it really it pales in comparison to actually being there and experiencing that event. The conversations I had at our 20th high school reunion were only slightly less awkward than the conversations <laughs> you were having with them. And I could always just plead that I couldn't hear them. <laughs> so, oh, sorry, I can't hear you. It's not that you're boring and I don't want to talk to you. It's just I can't hear you. <laughs> but again, I mean, you know, we FaceTime or Skype with our family every week just to say hi to the kids and everything. But it's still coming out here and actually seeing them spending time with people really makes a difference. Now, I don't know if VR for those sort of experiences is going to make things you know, that much more personal. I mean, especially you get these haptic suits or whatever. I mean, that's the thing, right? It's like, okay, you, know, you got to hug your grandkids, right? <laughs> well, what are you really doing? You're wearing a suit and the suit is pushing against you to make it feel like you're hugging your kid, this <laughs> yeah. kid, right? Is it, I don't know, is it creepy? <laughs> or <laughs> will, people, will people accept that as like, you know, the real deal? I don't know. Maybe they will. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's certainly an improvement. I mean, you yeah. know, we have this experience where, yeah, you know, where you are so far away and it is hard to keep up. But I think about even 15, 20 years ago, if you were in Australia, I mean, we probably wouldn't keep in touch half as much as we do even now, which yeah. is, you know, which is strained. <laughs> yeah. But even just having that, the, the ability to have a video call every once in a while allows us to at least still feel connected in some way when we're not able to get back and forth to see each other.
So we need to wrap this up so that I can go have some of those real world experiences with my family while I'm here. <laughs> By which he means lobster. <laughs> exactly. But we did want to bring in a bit of the political angle to this too. And, and what does all this technology and development mean for the future of politics or libertarianism? I think reflecting on some of the topics we've covered here, we started by talking about smart cities. And there's this idea that smart cities are going to develop as this kind of centralized top-down system of management that's going to be controlled by, you know, your, your city governments. But I think that could possibly take a different turn, where once you have all these systems that are being maintained by, let's say, private organizations, I mean, yeah, the, the cities might have some involvement, but they're probably going to be contracting out some of these services yeah. for more specialized service providers to be managing these, these smart networks and smart grids and smart roads and everything. Maybe that starts to create a situation where there becomes kind of a logical inheritor <laughs> of something like a public road system. You know, mm -hmm. maybe you get to a point where you have some company managing a, a network of roads where at some point they turn to the government and say, hey, you know what? If you turn all these roads over to us, you know, to own and maintain and we'll preserve all the rights as we've kind of talked about, we'll preserve all the rights for people to use them. But if we can own and maintain these roads, then we can do it much more efficiently than you can. And whether it's some kind of a lease or an actual ownership thing, you know, maybe there becomes some kind of a path there to privatizing public infrastructure for the purpose of making it more efficient in terms of the, the, this kind of idea of smart cities. Right. And again, if you've got these transit systems that are more decentralized and more adaptive, like we discussed, mm -hmm. you know, rather than having everyone clamoring for some big light rail system or something like that, everyone's just using the Ubers and Lyfts and whatever else comes along which are developing as private companies. Right, so that the modes of transport, you know, the, the actual vehicles, probably makes more sense to have a lot more of them be individually owned or I should say privately owned vehicles rather than a government-owned subway car. Right. <laughs> it's much more modular automated vehicles that are capable of all working together to transport people more efficiently into and out of the city. And more broadly, this trend of decentralization is happening in other industries as well. I mean, we talked about energy generation, which again reduces the need for any sort of centralized ownership or, or centralized kind of government control of a network or of these generation assets. It's the sort of thing where you know, most people don't care about politics and about who owns things or whatever, but when they start using Uber and they, they see how much better that works than either the public transport or the government-regulated taxi system, then they naturally prefer that more kind of free market solution. And so once everyone's generating power on their roof, and they get their battery packs or whatever, and they're generating all their own power and fulfilling their own needs, as well as being able to sell the excess power onto others. So they're seeing those direct benefits from that stuff, from the decentralization. Again, you know, you're not going to have people clamoring to build some new power station, a new solar farm, you know, as a centralized asset. You're going to have people who are looking for ways to support these more decentralized solutions, which is, I think, necessarily going to mean more of a free market approach to things and, and you know, less regulation. Yeah. There's always this question with new technology of, you know, is, is it something that's going to liberate us or is it something that's going to turn around and give governments, you know, more power and make it easier for them to regulate us and to, to micromanage our lives? You know, and I think the answer is both. But my hope is that in general, the kinds of technologies we're talking about and thinking about for the future are things that tend to empower the individual. So things like individualized automated transportation. Things like person-to-person -person communication with virtual reality and even, you know, having some kind of virtual worlds that people can participate in yeah. and socialize in where they're really developing their own systems of working with each other and of cooperating with each other and kind of coming up with these, you know, alternate, uh, maybe alternate rule systems or <laughs> yeah. alternate ways of interacting that could start to inform how they interact in the real world. Yeah, there's actually a Minecraft world that's been created by, this is another guy who's been promoted by uh, Tom Woods, huh. has created this Liberty Minecraft. Oh, yeah. And uh, he, he does these posts every now and then about, you know, what, what's going on in the world. It's, it's fascinating to see the sort of stuff that's happening. You know, it's oh, like, yeah. you know, the, the price of diamonds, you know, went from $4,000 down to 30 cents because, you know, some guy opened up a production line or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's amazing to see kind of, kind of what happens. And that is exactly one of those kind of virtual worlds where, you know, people uh -huh. are trying things out. Out. And, you know, you can kind of demonstrate the way these things happen in this virtual world. And then, you know, maybe that influences kind of how they approach the real world. <laughs> <laughs> you 
Yeah, so I think that, again, there's this trend toward, well, really two trends. One is towards individualization. So you're, you're empowering the individual through technology. But you're also creating more opportunities for socialization, where it becomes easier for people to connect and communicate with each other and network with each other in the way that they often do in cities now. You know, maybe something like virtual reality helps to make that even easier and helps to spread that network out beyond the cities in much more efficient ways, which helps to spread opportunity, helps to spread ideas, and again, helps to empower people. And ultimately, I think that when individuals feel empowered, that they become less and less dependent on government and possibly even start to see government as an impediment to their progress, and not only to their own personal progress, but to societal progress, you know, to their ability to, to help other people and to improve the world. Of course, there's always these concerns about someone being left behind. I think the most popular job in the U.S. right now is truck driver. You know, so when you've got automated trucks driving everything around, what's going to happen to all those guys? Right. And this is always a tricky issue because it's the sort of thing where you have two trends accelerating in opposite directions. You know, you've got this trend of technology taking over jobs, but at the same time, you've got the trend of technology producing more and more goods so that you end up with this sort of mass abundance and the prices of everyday goods for everyone just become almost negligible. Now, it's hard to make a claim that, you know, everything's just automatically going to be all right, and, and there's not going to be any problems that arise from this. And, you know, we're seeing now all, all this, a lot of unemployment and drug abuse problems and stuff like that happening just with the modern economy. We would argue that a lot of that unemployment is due more to bad government policies, which make it harder to hire people. Not to mention policies that generate inflation and you know, right, and keep prevent the, those prevent prices, prices from falling, from falling to the, the point where more people can afford things. Yeah. So, I mean, so I think we've been pretty optimistic in general throughout the course of this discussion, mm -hmm. you know, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that we've got blinders on, I don't think. Well, yeah, with any technology, of course, is the technologies we're talking about. We're talking about them because they are disruptive technologies. Right. And disruptive technologies can make massive improvements in the quality of life. But at the time that they're disrupting, <laughs> they can really upset the status quo for a lot of people who have come to live in a certain way or come to work in a certain profession that's now being overturned. You know, if, I'm, if I've worked 20 years as a mason and, you know, the next job, my boss brings or puts a robot on the site, right. you know, how do I feel about that? <laughs> yeah. Probably not too good. So there's certainly a challenge for people, especially in lower skilled professions, to try to maintain relevance in the economy and to find a set of skills that they can offer to people. You know, when you have, if you have Rosie the Robot cleaning your house, you know, <laughs> that disrupts a lot of people at the lowest end of the income spectrum who may not have any other skills other than cleaning houses. But it could be that due to the abundance of all these new goods in the future that, you know, maybe you don't need to have two incomes in a household to maintain the same standard of living. Maybe, you know, that one person can stay home and look after the kids or whatever. And, you know, you've only got one income, but you're still maintaining the same or maybe even a better standard of living. Mm -hmm. And it could be that if wages and prices are both allowed to fall to the level that they need to, then the robots might not be that competitive after all. So you gave the example of a mason, you know, losing his job to this mason laying robot. Well, maybe that mason, instead of laying bricks in a straight line, gets into some sort of like freestone work or something like that, which mm -hmm. is, you know, something that would be much more difficult for the robots to do. Mm -hmm. And so maybe as a result, you get some trend because everyone's got bricks all over the place. Maybe freestone work becomes much more affordable for people because you have a lot more people doing that. And all of a sudden you've got this boom in demand for freestone masons or yeah, something like right. that, you know? I mean, that's the sort of thing where you just can't predict what's going to happen once markets and, and human choice are involved. But it could mean that a lot of these people who currently have these sort of low-skill jobs are in a position where they have to become more entrepreneurial in order to get by. And that could work out great for a lot of them. So instead of working on a production line, you, you get into some sort of handmade goods or something like that, which again, you know, maybe there'll be more of a demand for that stuff once everything's 3D printed. I mean, it's, it's kind of like that now, <laughs> right. you know, you, everything's kind of mass produced and 3D printing, but there's, there's demand for these sort of authentic handmade goods and yeah. antiques and stuff like that. Or you get people restoring old cars. And it could be that you know, these people just have to become a bit more entrepreneurial. You know, and it's, again, it's not going to work out for everybody. There's going to be some people who just really struggle to take on that kind of a role. But there are other opportunities out there. And, and you do hear these success stories all, all over the place with people doing e-commerce and stuff like that, where, right. <laughs> you know, they quit their job as a carpenter or something, and all of a sudden they're making 30 grand a month on, you know, <laughs> selling trinkets on YouTube or something. <laughs> well, it could be that you don't necessarily have to have people, you know, hitting it big, you know. Right. But in this, the, the kind of economy we're talking about where you have more automation and that's more driven by technology. 
there could be more more opportunities there for passive income. So you know, you look at something like Uber, where now all of a sudden everybody can take their car, you know, their own personal vehicle, and turn that into a profit center for themselves. Right. And that becomes that's not exactly passive income because right now you're still driving that around yourself. <laughs> but there might be more kind of smaller scale, call it investment opportunities, where people can make some small upfront investment in some kind of technology. And then that thing is is producing. Maybe it's even, you know, they buy a 3D printer that can produce the things that they need for their house yeah. or something like that. And, and then they have make extra stuff for other people. Or I think that thinking about not just earning income, but in being productive, you know, and generating goods and services for people, I think those opportunities are going to increase for people to do the kind of things that, you know, years ago, you might have taken a whole factory and all kinds of infrastructure yeah. to do, or, you know, to invent something or to manufacture something. I think there are going to be lots of those kinds of opportunities that we can't even imagine today. And getting back to the sort of political outlook, too, when you've got a lot more people acting in these more entrepreneurial roles, they're going to be much more likely to be libertarian-minded or at least in favor of free markets and low regulations than they would if they're working some factory job and expecting everything to be handed down to them. So in that regard, there's certainly some reason to be optimistic. Thanks for listening. The most important issue of the future is, of course, the future of An Architecture Podcast. If you want to support us, please visit us at anarchitecturepodcast.com and look in the sidebar on the right-hand side for a couple of different ways that you can support the podcast. At the top right, you can click a button to visit our Patreon page and pledge a recurring donation. And if you scroll down, you'll see a QR code, which you can use to send us Bitcoin. So visit anarchitecturepodcast.com, and we'll see you in the future. They are robots in disguise, let's remember. Gee, 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 gee. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>